Ladies and gentlemen, stand up and get loud for the greatest talk show in television history, everybody. Welcome, everybody, to Fans Talk Pro Wrestling. This is episode 414 being recorded on Wednesday, March 14th, 2018. My name is Nick, and with me, as per usual, is Adam. How's it going, Adam? It's going all right, Nick. We're officially in uh, the home stretch to WrestleMania. I'm a little excited about that. Yes, God help us all. Uh, in the <laughs> meantime, it's Pi Day, everybody. How do you feel about that? Um, I haven't done any, uh, proper celebration. I have not partaken of any pie. Um, I haven't either. <laughs> at least not yet. I suppose I still have an opportunity. But, uh, hey, for anyone that celebrates, happy pie day. Uh, it is a shame that on the eve of it that, uh, we got the unfortunate news, uh, of Stephen Hawking. But, uh, you know, my condolences for that. Um, and, and hopefully, uh, we can come out with some with some better stuff today, a little bit more cheery. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so on this Pi Day, uh, we are discussing the aftermath of Fastlane. Uh, as you alluded to, Adam, uh, we are properly on the road to WrestleMania, for what that is worth. Uh, but we're going to be unpacking Fastlane as it happened. We're also going to be getting into some news stories. Uh, it's pretty much all WWE-centric this week. Uh, starting with... There was a slew of releases from NXT. Uh, in particular, the two that we know about right now uh, are Sage Beckett and Abby Lath. Uh, both cut from their NXT contracts. Uh, neither revealed any reasons why, uh, either on their part or on the WWE's part. Uh, there are rumors, of course, but uh, for Abby's part, at any rate, she's already got some indie bookings. Uh, for instance, she is returning to Beyond Wrestling, one of her home promotions before she was signed. She was also announced as part of Chikara's King of Trios upcoming event um, as part of uh, a longtime team with Los Ice Creams. Uh, and she's been advertised at various different places like Defy Wrestling and places like that. So uh, at the very least, Abby is landing on her feet uh, with with ease. I don't expect Sage will have any problems finding bookings either. Um, Frankly, I'm a little surprised that she was let go, considering that the WWE liked to make a lot out of her connection to Team 3D, uh, them having been her trainers. But I expect she'll be able to find work pretty easily, too. Um, but what do you think, Adam? Like, it, it's weird that Abby got let go before she could really do anything. Like, she's easily one of the better wrestlers they have. And for them not to be able to find a spot for her on TV seems weird, right? Uh, I suppose I, I have to be honest. I don't know, uh, too much about the history of these two. Um, so I, I can't really speak to their quality of wrestling. I do think it's important to note though, that, uh, just because this is goodbye for now, doesn't necessarily mean it's goodbye forever. You know, there's been several talent who have, uh, potentially washed out of the system before that have been able to come back when, you know, there's more room or maybe the creative department has been reshuffled since or, or what have you. So I, I mean, it's, a, I think it's important to know, especially with a lot of young talent like this, that, um, there's always a chance that they could return. Um, and, and hopefully when they do, um, they'll have a better stake at, 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 uh, what what would be in store for them in the future from that point forward. So uh, I, it's kind of, I think, more of a cost-cutting thing than it is a spite on the wrestlers themselves. Uh, I think WWE kind of has gotten into the business practice of giving talent the opportunity to sort of uh, heat themselves up uh, elsewhere and then potentially offer them contracts again, uh, whether that is morally a... Right or wrong decision, I think that's up to the uh, listener at hand. But, uh, you know, it, it from a business sense, it, it makes a little sense to me. I, I honestly don't even see the business sense. Like, Sage Beckett, maybe. Um, but Abby Lath, I mean, she was – she is so damn good. And the fact that out of the entire Mayon Classic, the two biggest 
focuses have been on Shayna Baszler and Bianca Belair. That's weird. I, I there's nothing wrong with them technically speaking, but like this this whole focus on Shayna Baszler being the number one contender at in at infinitum, I might argue ad nauseum for Ember Moon. I, I I don't get it. I have to. I have to wonder if it's just because she's Ronda Rousey's friend, and like with Bianca, I I haven't really seen any real program with her. It it just feels like it's been all jobber matches, and every now and again they'll throw somebody with a name up against her, but she still squashes them. And I don't get it. Like she's not really showing me a hell of a lot, and. You know, she's married to Montez Ford. Like, that's not exactly the the kind of hook that being Ronda Rousey's friend is. But, you know, that is a hook. So I I, I just don't get it, to be honest. I, I mean, it's fair. I do think that uh, in the women you mentioned, uh, you know, Basler, Belair, even Ember Moon, I do think there is a certain uh, markability, market ability that they're characters kind of already have and and granted you can easily say that it's gimmicky especially in the case of bel-air uh but it's like i mean it, yeah i guess i relate it to you know my own personal uh experience with with trying to get creative things off the ground you know i think i've said it before that i i do enjoy writing and i've tried to get that into you know the the forefront and and actually you know make it something that other people are able to get their hands on and it's tough man because if they don't see you uh out the gate as something that they that is worth getting their money behind then you know that they're instantly going to tell you no and they might not be right but you know unfortunately they also have the power so it's it's tough but again i think especially if lathe uh, is as good as as you and other people have said they are. I think we will potentially see her back sooner than later. I would hope so. Uh, that is an incredibly dumb move that they made, to be frank. But fair, yeah. Uh, it, it certainly doesn't seem like they're hurting for for work, though. Yeah. Uh, moving along, mentioned Ronda Rousey earlier, and uh, this past Raw, she. Uh, was not present, even though the WWE advertised that she would be appearing on every pre-mania Raw. Uh, the story goes at the moment that that article on WWE.com that said she'd be on for every Raw was um, posted too early. Uh, it, the, the plan, in fact, was not for her to appear this week on Raw. Uh, she still had medical testing that needed to be undergone in Pittsburgh, apparently. So that's where she was on Monday, and uh, they have reiterated the promise that she will be on every Raw till Mania going forward. Honestly, I I could do without Ronda for a variety of reasons. She hasn't exactly lit the world on fire with the appearances she's made. I am not looking forward to this mixed tag match in the slightest. And she's... I can't even say it's because she's a bad promo, because I've seen her talk leading up to UFC fights, she is a good promo. But now you have the added fan factor, um, both in the sense that she is a fan of the product, and I don't think these are the kinds of fans that she is used to. Um, so, yeah, the, the fact that they're announcing that she's going to be here every week moving forward and that this was just kind of a a weird blip on the radar – it's so so for me. Um, what about you, Adam? Like, have has Ronda Rousey and the WWE done anything for you yet? Are you looking forward to her appearances moving forward? Like, is this just whatever? Um, it, it's kind of whatever for me. I don't think I, I I'm not necessarily super down on it. You know, I, I'm uh, at the very least morbidly interested, but I'd like to think of myself as being a little bit a little bit more interested than just that. Um. I want to see what she can do in the ring. That's for sure. Uh, and, and honestly, I think her being absent from raw this week, like you said, is fine. I think this narrative that we have to have a, a segment to further each storyline every week is, is false. I mean, 
you know, Lucha Underground proves that all the time. They can go sometimes months before readdressing another storyline. And I think it works. I think, you know, I've, I've said it many times, maximizing your minutes and, and, you know, heating and cooling things, you know, carefully, I think can, can really keep someone interested and, and keep that uh, lackadaisical attitude from setting in about like, oh, well, here's the here's the slot for, you know, Matt Hardy and, and Bray Wyatt. And here's the slot for Cena challenging The Undertaker. And here's the slot for, you know, uh, it doesn't matter how many times you jumble those up. If that's all you see every week, that is part of what, you know, I've said before, makes the show feel mundane. So I think the hype with the mixed tag matches as good as it's going to be uh going into mania i know i'm a fool for thinking that they'll ever they they won't do any segments up till up till mania from now that's that's obviously ridiculous thinking on my part but i think you know less is more being the right approach here and frankly in other storylines too can actually do uh, the WWE a better service than than to constantly, you know, say, well, here comes Roman Reigns to talk about uh, to talk about Brock Lesnar. And, and, you know, this is the fourth time this month that he's not shown up. And, you know, it's saying the same thing in a bunch of different ways. It doesn't it, eventually it get it gets redundant. So I, I think it's fine that uh, Ronda skipped this week and didn't need to. uh didn't need to show up. Um, as far as the match itself, like I said, I want to see her compete. Um, I want to see what she can do, you know, in the tenets of a wrestling match and, and how she can work the crowd if she is able to and whatnot. Um, so in that way, I'm kind of excited about it. I think it's not a terrible way to kind of break her into what, you know, working a storyline is like as opposed to just being technically sound in the ring. Um, you, she's got, you know, three – veteran you know uh uh people to mm-hmm. kind of show it well you sure <laughs> i knew that was going to get a little bit of a call out uh but you know what i mean she's she's got people that have been on tv for a very long time and know at least the basics of how to structure a story whether they do that well or not i will leave entirely to the debate of everyone listening um so I think I think it's overall a good thing. It's probably not going to be the match that I'm looking the most forward to uh, at, at WrestleMania. And I would definitely also say in answer to Beanbag's question, it, I have a high doubt that it's going to main event the card. Uh, but there's no chance I, in hell. Yeah, I don't think so either. I think like, both, it's it's Triple both. H and Stephanie, sure, but. Yeah, you know, it's an attraction match on a card where you're going to have Roman Reigns versus Brock Lesnar for the Universal Title, and John Cena versus The Undertaker. I mean, and uh, Shinsuke versus AJ. So, yeah. I mean, sure, I'm not necessarily guaranteeing that's going to be at the main event, but that's definitely more main event worthy than I think the mixed tag match. I I am <laughs> like 75 percent certain that's going to open the show. But, I, I don't <laughs> necessarily think that's a bad position for that match either. You know, um, I mean, it, I think it absolutely really... is, but it fits the whole narrative of uh, Raw is the main event and uh, SmackDown's uh, whatever. Uh, we've got to focus on Raw and Brock Lesnar and Roman Reigns. Sure, but I think you couldn't ask for a more hot opener <laughs> in in the same vein, to be honest. But, you know, that, I'm sure we can save that for when we get a little closer to Mania. Yeah. Uh, as, as far as the match itself goes... I I think I said this last week, but I, I expect this to go very similarly to um to another match of this mm, caliber is not the right word composition. Uh, back in TNA, when uh, not long after Angle divorced his first wife, uh, Karen, who would go on to become Karen Jarrett, there was a mixed tag match between Jeff and Karen Jarrett and Kurt Angle and China, and in that match. Karen and China only stepped into the ring a couple of times. I think Karen took one move, maybe. I fully expect this to be similar. Um, Ronda might hit Stephanie with that, um, with that, frankly, thunderous Samoan drop. Um, she corrected us on Twitter and called it something else, but like it's a Samoan drop. You're in wrestling now. Um, <laughs> but I, it's, it's Stephanie. She's not a wrestler. I've, Contrary to what her, her contract says. And Ronda Rousey's not a wrestler. Um, she is... Yet. 
if, well, like the the closest thing you could call her is a judica. That that's kind of it. That's not really pro wrestling. She, it's too soon for her to figure this stuff out yet. So I, I figure right. we're going to see an ankle lock. I figure we're going to see that Simone drop, and maybe something else. Like we might see her block uh, another, uh, th- uh, another punch from Stephanie and a hip toss, but. Yeah, it's it's going to be Kurt and Triple H doing most of the heavy lifting. Like, that's where most of the beef is anyway. Sure. And it's disappointing in that vein because, I, again, kind of speaking to the Mixed Mac Challenge as well, uh, I wish they had booked this as an intergender match because I think that both Kurt and Triple H could work better with Rousey, uh, either of them or both of them, than, than uh, uh, Stephanie ever could, breaking her in. So it's yeah. kind of unfortunate that that this is you know this is what we end up getting. Uh, yeah, but it's, it's it's a it WWE. It yeah, like we're we're definitely going to see Angle get slapped. We're definitely going to see Triple H get thrown at least once by Rousey. But yeah, sure. Yeah. Maybe even get tied in some knots by some submissions or something. Yeah, that might be after the bell. Potentially, yeah. Um. Hmm, how do we transition this here? Um, so Rousey was getting medical testing done. Uh, perhaps she was getting fucked up on anesthesia. Speaking of fucked up, Jeff Hardy was arrested and hit with a DWI in my backyard. Um, metaphorically speaking. Sure. So. Well, he lives there too, right? Uh, no, he lives out east. Uh, Cameron, North Carolina. Ah, I see. Gotcha. Yeah, um. So he was in my neck of the woods, actually, Uh, not really 10 minutes from my house when uh, on Saturday, apparently he veered off the road and hit a guardrail and then he spun out into the middle of the road Uh, In a subsequent breath test. He wound up blowing uh, three times over the legal limit. Uh, He has had his driver's license revoked uh, uh, revoked pending trial and I. we don't know when the trial date is going to be, but he is going to be uh, facing court in the not too distant future, I imagine. Uh, no idea yet on whether this screws with any potential mania plans. He did end up filming uh, a cameo for Ultimate Deletion prior to the DWI. But yeah, it, I don't really understand, first of all, what Jeff was doing out here. And secondly, why he would risk screwing things up with WWE. Um, cynics would argue it's Jeff Hardy. This is what he does. But, you know, he's he's been in a pretty good place. Like, I, I can't remember an incident since, you know, the, the big one where he had the, uh, the opioid uh, yeah. bust at his place. And like, right. after he came back to TNA and had his big redemption run, I don't remember anything like this happening. Um, so it, it really is a damn shame. I hope that, you know, he, he gets whatever help he needs. And I, I hope that this doesn't screw things up for him. Um, Cause I mean, everybody wants to see him have a real singles run in WWE. I think like that's where the money is long-term, especially given how they're mishandling Matt versus Bray. So I don't know. Maybe there's a little bit of Homer in me that that's rooting for him illogically. But, you know, I I want to see him go on to do good things and not have shitty things happen to him. Sure. I mean, I think it's fair to acknowledge that uh, an inebriated uh, brain does not exactly think as clearly as one that is uh, perfectly sober. I think they've actually done tests about that. Uh, so it's not extremely hard for me to see why in the moment he would think that was a very good decision, uh, and, and, you know, later on suffer the consequences. Uh, it is unfortunate to see, uh, I kind of agree with beanbags in the live chat once more that I think as long as there's no narcotics, uh, he's he's going to probably be fine. Uh, at the very least, I mean, we've seen this example before almost literally in the exact time of year uh, with uh, Jack Swagger in the past. And uh, he went on to become Mr. Money in the Bank. So I, I think WWE kind of views alcohol uh, as I think 
unfortunately quite a few people in the country do as not as big a deal as it probably should be. Um, I don't necessarily think that Jeff should be released over it, but I definitely think, you know, if, if Triple H got punished for the curtain call, I mean, definitely Jeff should get some sort of, you know, uh, reprimand from the company. Uh, and I don't know what that could be, but it's, it, I mean, I unless Jeff is going someplace else to, to work and flipping the bird to WWE, I, I, I don't think he's should be concerned about that. Sure. But, you know, I don't know. I, I think there should be some form of punishment at the very least. But we'll have to see. Um, you know, speaking to the the Matt Hardy, Bray Wyatt thing for just a second, I'm actually pretty excited. We have to. <laughs> What's that? I said, do we have to? Okay. I'll, I'll wait for <laughs> later on in the show then. <laughs> um, God, there really is no good segue for this. Uh, Kid Rock's <laughs> going into the Hall of Fame. Not everything needs a segue, man. You could just... Yeah, Go right but into it. <laughs> I know it's it smooth. offends my sensibilities. It, uh, not quite as much as Kid Rock does, but I, I like smooth transitions. Sure, I feel you. But uh, being the antithesis of smooth, uh, Kid Rock is going to be honored alongside the Dudleys, Hillbilly Jim, Goldberg, uh, all that bunch. And how the fuck he got in ahead of Fred Durst, I have no idea. <laughs> like I well, am no I mean, Limp Biscuit fan, but like Limp Biscuit is WWE's favorite band, and he played in <laughs> the goddamn Undertaker. Like, like Kid Rock played at a WrestleMania, like what, almost ten years ago now, when he played at a tribute to the troops once. Like that's his in. I think he's played a couple times at WrestleMania, hasn't he? Uh, I've only seen uh, people talking about one because I know there was the lame. Uh, the lame like entrance of uh of the all the divas for like the the well the divas at the time for the big battle royal they were having for the match uh and then there was like a, an actual thing that happened uh, i don't think it was mania but i don't remember anyway I, i'm having my mind blown in the live chat right now uh, he's the lead singer for acdc now uh i didn't know that either can't be well, yeah, didn't something happen to uh Brian I have Singer? no idea. Like I I, think, I haven't been I I think uh yeah, Brian Singer's had some uh medical problems. Oh, Brian Johnson I meant to say. Yeah, there you go. After a heart attack. Yeah, uh, ACDC's not exactly on my radar, but Yeah. Oh my fucking god. Yeah. Yeah, kind of a sad day. I mean, I I I kind of get it with Kid Rock over Limp Bizkit, despite the fact that they are WWE's favorite band. I mean, Limp Bizkit hasn't done anything for God. I, I, I literally years. do not understand because Kid Rock hasn't either. Sure. I think he's been more like relevant to pop culture in general. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's but more. I mean, it, it's it's it's. Yeah, but it's Fred Durst. He is the embodiment of pro wrestling and music. Like, I'm yeah, not a fan of his. Like. At all. That dude is kind of trash. But so is WWE. It, it, like, they are two sure. very compatible piles of trash. Sure. I, I don't know. I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, I feel the same as you. Like, not necessarily angered, I guess. I don't know if you're angered or not. But I don't feel angered that he's in the Hall of Fame. I'm very indifferent to it, you know. Uh, this, this, this year's class, I think, is a little meh <laughs> for me yeah uh i think the only people i'm really excited for are the dudleys um everyone else like i'm not hating on them being in the hall of fame but i'm not like oh my god finally yeah i mean like <laughs> good on ivory like, she definitely should have gone in a long time ago uh as far as i'm aware it was just politics getting in the way yeah um Hillbilly Jim, like, I have no frame of reference for the dude, but apparently he was a big deal back in the day. So, like, kudos. Um, He's a good guy, too, from I, all the things I've heard. The the Warrior Award re recipient, like, sure. Like, if, if if they really cared, they'd find a better name for the award. But, like, the, the kid I have absolutely no issue with. Uh, uh, like, no, China has not been inducted into the Hall of Fame. Uh, no, no, she she hasn't. And if the WWE has her way, she never will be because like they have all kinds of double standards for who should go in. 
Right. Um, but like, and again, it's a WWE Hall of Fame. Like, it, none of that shit matters in the slightest in any real sense. But putting a shit lizard like Kid Rock on a pedestal, any pedestal, that that doesn't sit well with me. Like, I I can't even say I'm I'm angry about him going in. Like, I I I am kind of offended. Uh. Because that man is an affront to all kinds of things like art, entertainment, music, uh, you name it. He has probably done something to disgrace it. But, like, sure. It's, it's Vince McMahon. That's the kind of shit he goes in for. What am I going to do? I don't know, man. <sighs> but <laughs> something I, I would very much like to do about is, is this next bit of news. Wait, wait. It blows my fucking mind that this is indeed a headline, but the WWE has announced that there will be a women's battle royal uh, as a counterpart to the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal for the men. And they, they named it after the fabulous Moolah, which is interesting because for a couple of years there, it seemed like they wanted to do anything but bring up Moolah. And for very good reason. Uh, speaking of shit lizards, she was kind of a monster. Uh, for those that do not know, Mula was far from the paragon of women's wrestling that the WWE claims her to be. Um, like in the announcement video, they hailed her as a pioneer and a trailblazer in women's wrestling. When really she set it back at least two decades and held it back for even longer. There are a, a number of articles detailing all the monstrous shit she did. Far better than I ever could in this format. But kind of the too long didn't read version is that she was a human trafficker, a sex trafficker, using the girls that she trained as political currency with different promoters around the company, including Vince. Um, she took a cut of all her girls' bookings, uh, a, a huge cut, would lie about the money that the girls did get for their work in various promotions. Uh, let's see. Uh, she forced all of her students to live on the land she owned, forced them to pay rent, forced them to pay for utilities, forced them to pay for, for room and board. And like, various students of hers, like, she would go out of her way to kneecap with other promoters. Like, should they prove to be any better than her, which wasn't a high bar. Uh, women like Luna Vachon, uh, Sherry Martell w would have made a far larger impact in wrestling had it not been for Moolah getting in the ears of Vince McMahon and other promoters like him. And the only reason she's hailed as as this this pioneer of women's wrestling is that she's the only high-profile name, her and, and Mae Young, that would work with Vince. Specifically for the reason that Moolah had Vince's ear. And any other woman that was halfway decent, she would stab in the back, she would, she would politic around, and essentially push them to the outer edges of the business. Like, there is a reason that American women's wrestling is so far behind, or was so far behind for, for decades, behind Japanese women's wrestling, Mexican women's wrestling, like even up in Canada. Granted, Canadian women's wrestling was very much influenced by the American scene. There weren't a lot of big promotions up there, but like, it, it cannot be stated enough how detrimental Moolah was to wrestling in general and women's wrestling in particular. Like, she is the reason that for for decades, women's wrestling in the WWF was just hair pulling cat balls and nothing else. She's the reason why it was stuck so long on the bra and panty matches, the, the mud wrestling, all of that bullshit. When in Japan, you had people like Minami Toyota, Aja Kong, and all of those huge names, the jumping bomb angels over there. They were breaking down barriers left and right and having fantastic wrestling matches. And nobody could see that in the States precisely because of Moolah's legacy. And 
for the WWE to talk out of both sides of their mouth like this, to constantly tout the women's revolution that they are spearheading to, to, to hear them talk. And then to have this battle royal be a part of Moolah's legacy and to make your talent talk about like, this is a great thing. Like, fuck that shit, man. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, I am uh, feeling the need that we should say that a lot of those charges were alleged. I mean, I don't have a problem believing that they were true, but. Yeah, her are trainees <laughs> are the source for all this shit. Like, you have to say alleged because nothing was proven in court. Sure. And she's dead now, so it's not like you can exactly go after her. But allegedly You're right. is an extremely <laughs> shitty formality. Like, this shit happened. I, I wouldn't be surprised, considering the, the the time and the, you know, the way the business uh, was. And it's only very recently, you know, coming out of that kind of dark age in its treatment of women, um, comparatively, at the very least. I don't have a problem believing that a lot of that shit happened. Um yeah, I mean, it's shitty. I think uh, there are at least five different women I can count on my on my uh, fingers that uh, would be better to name it after. You know, even even more recent talent, you know. Why not a, a Trish Status, Alita, you know, uh, anyone. <laughs> anyone. Just pick anyone. And I've seen a lot of, of names floated around that people say wouldn't work because – like Luna Vachon, Sherry Martell, Miss Elizabeth, women like that that are high, high profile enough and did enough in the business, they also wound up dying in drug overdoses. Like considering how the WWE blackballs China because of her, her her porn career, that's another thing I can definitely see the WWE shying away from. And again, the, the subject of double standards comes up because Mula did far worse, but again. She was the only high profile woman that would work with them for years. So I and I'm seeing in the live chat, they could rename it to the Mae Young Memorial Battle Royal. And like, that's a bad move, too, because in all of the the rush to explain to people why Moolah was such a terrible person, like some history was also pub not publicized because this was out, but also brought to the forefront about how. Mae Young wasn't exactly a great person either. Um, the way she would like sucker in married men and and ambush them and rob them, and the married men wouldn't talk about it because they were married. They were following up on her advances, uh, get them alone and whatnot. But like, I wouldn't rate that as bad as a lot of the shit Mula pulled. But still, robbery and assault. Not great. I mean, I think it, it sort of <laughs> stems to a larger, larger argument in the world uh, that I feel uh, is it has at least some truth to it in that uh, no one in this world is completely innocent. And I don't mean to defend anyone by saying that. But, you know, everyone's got skeletons in their closet. There's there's no perfect person in the world. And I think that's never been truer than when you talk about a lot of the talent uh, previously in wrestling. Uh, the, there's a lot of, you know, I mean, considering the origins of wrestling in general, there's a lot of shady people that were attracted to the business and have left their mark on it for better or worse. Um, it's why, you know, I, even though I know they're probably trying to look for a talent that has the same reverence as, as Andre for the, for the men's battle Royal that happens at, at Mania. But I just, I think it's, you're hard pressed to find a talent like that unless you wanted to go like maybe with the laundry blaze but then you know you got all the other uh things that maybe have happened to, well not maybe but did happen with her that maybe weren't outright bad as in like what may and moolah did but i mean she still kind of burned her bridges over in wcw and that'll always have a taint and people will kind of point at that and be like well that doesn't necessarily make her deserving of be having a battle royal named after her you know, I, I, I dropped Trish and Lita, but obviously they have, you know, they have things in their, uh, not maybe in their, well, yeah, in their past. But again, not as offensive, but still, the, the, there's always going to be someone saying, hey, this person isn't good enough to live up to the name that 
that you're trying to inject with all this history and reverence. And naming a match after Andre is problematic in its own right, because Andre attacked a lot of people, police officers included. It's, yeah, pro wrestling comes from a pretty shitty place. And a lot of the people that we hold in reverence for being great wrestlers were also shitty people. Take Hulk Hogan. Mm -hmm. It's, it's almost like, you know, maybe you shouldn't attach a name to women's, to this battle royal. Just call it the women's battle royal. It's not like they do anything important with the Andre winner anyway. They they carry around a statue until it breaks on, on some rando raw. Right. Generally within a month of winning it. <laughs> yeah. But I, I just can't get over how much of a slap in the face this is to all the women that are going to be working in that match when the namesake of the match did so much to hurt their prospects. Like her, her influence is going to be felt for decades to come because even now you still got large swaths of the, of the audience that still treat the women's match as a bathroom break because nothing exciting is going to happen here. And it's, it's even worse than the Indies because people are only just starting to get over the idea that, Hey, women can be a draw. And, and book them in equal measure. Like that, there's still a, a hugely predominant mindset among indie promoters that, well, we have to have the women's match. Not, hey, let's book the best talent that we can. It's uh, just to cover our bases. We need a women's match too. So, fuck sure. Mula, fuck Vince. I. <sighs> I don't expect them to change a name because it's a WWE, but if they, if there was any justice, they would. Yeah. And I guess to sort of leave this topic on a somewhat positive note, um, it is unfortunate that the women that will be booked into this battle royal have to work under that name. But I also believe in the ability to, you know, take whatever potential success you might gain from that and turn it into a positive thing and, and use it for your own self-promotion to take essentially at least some of the power away from, you know, the taint of moolah and all that stuff and, and make it your own, you know, if not outright in name, at least in action, I believe just about all of the women uh, on the, uh, on the, on any of the rosters right now in WWE uh, have that ability and power to do that. This is a WWE. Nobody gets over on their own. Ask Rusev. I mean, I was tempted to leave it on a positive note, but there, there is no positive <laughs> note to end on with this story. Like it's just a massive shit fest. But hopefully, we'll be able to talk in more positive terms about other things that are happening in wrestling right now. Uh, starting with over in New Japan, uh, there is a tournament going on right now. Uh, in fact, I think we may be just a couple hours away from the next installment over uh, of it called the New Japan Cup. And what makes this tournament interesting is that the winner can challenge for any singles title they want. Uh, that is the IWGP Heavyweight title, the IWGP Intercontinental title, the Open Neverweight title. I believe the IWGP US title will be also be uh, a potential target. And I don't think there's any juniors in this tournament either. Uh, otherwise, those would also be on the line as well. But uh, we've already run through the first round, uh, wherein Michael Elgin defeated Tomohiro Ishii. Juice Robinson beat Yujiro Takahashi. Uh, Hiroshi Tanahashi defeated Taichi. Kind of a no-brainer. Bad Luck Fale defeated Lance Archer. Kota Ibushi defeated Yoshihashi. Zack Sabre Jr. defeated Naito in uh, something of a, an, an upset, I think. Toriyano defeated Davy Boy Smith Jr. And Sonata beat Chuck E.T. Uh, Chuck Taylor for the layman. We've already had a couple matches in the second round. Uh, not any less than 24 hours ago, in fact. Uh, Juice Robinson defeated Michael Elgin. Good. Tanahashi beat Bad Luck Fale. Again, I figure that's kind of a no-brainer. And uh, within the next few hours, we are going to be seeing Ibushi versus Zack Sabre Jr. and Yano versus Sonata. 
Uh, if I had to guess, I would think Ibushi and Sonata were going to advance. Could be surprised. Uh, it's not exactly like Naito losing to Saber was a uh, an obvious outcome. Uh, Yano could pull a rabbit out of a hat and low blow his way to victory over Sonata, but given the hot streak that Sonata's on right now, I doubt that'd be the case. Um, but yeah, I figure both matches are going to be pretty good. Uh, I have yet to see any of the New Japan Cup action personally. Uh, I'm going to go back and watch some of those matches like uh, Tanahashi versus Taichi. This is Taichi's first big foray into the heavyweight scene. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd like to see how he's trying to make his mark. Like, he's been talking a lot of shit toward Naito. And uh, since they both lost in the first round of the New Japan Cup, I think Taichi might try to lord that over Naito. Um, also, Zack Sabre Jr. making the bump up from the heavy, uh, from junior to heavyweight. Yeah, I, I just can't say that enough. Like, I never would have figured he would beat Naito in the first round. Um, I, I guess... It's interesting because Suzuki Goon's been lacking in heavyweights with any real profile. Uh, you've got the Killer Elite Squad and Lance Archer and Davy Boy Smith Jr., but they've always been a tag team. Up until recently, you had Shelton Benjamin in that stable, but obviously he's unavailable. And that kind of left Izuka, who has been um, undercard fodder. For the longest time, uh, the most interesting thing about him is he brings an iron gauntlet to the ring and uh, he has to be restrained by a leash by either Taka or El Desperado. Um, so, yeah, them having new heavyweights to rely on is, is probably a good thing. Taichi is arguably the most hated heel in New Japan right now. Zack Sabre Jr. He's got an interesting thing going on there. So, yeah, I mean, if nothing else... Saber versus Ibushi is going to be a hell of a match to watch. And Yano and Sonata always manage to put on good matches. Like, Sonata always shows a more, um, what's the word, mischievous side whenever he's in the ring with Yano. Like, him putting Yano in the Paradise Lock is always hilarious. Uh, so, yeah. I don't know if you have uh, any anything to add there, Adam, but uh, like, who, who do you think is going to win the New Japan Cup? Um, out of the winners that I see, um, I think think i think sonata's a pretty pretty solid horse to back um it i don't know it's getting close though uh abushi versus zach sober jr is going to be an interesting one to see how that develops uh if you guys didn't i think they met didn't they during the cruiserweight classic as well mm, i don't remember i can't remember either i, I want to say they met in the semifinals or finals um if not, you can see plenty of, of uh, their action if you have the network and haven't been able to see uh, Ibushi or Zack Sabre Jr. Uh, up until this point. Um, you could see them you know, wrestling many other people uh, and possibly each other <laughs> if you follow the whole tournament. Um, so it, seeing having seen both of them in action, it's going to be very interesting to see how uh, – see which of those two advance. Um I don't know if I mean I guess I could see Ibushi advancing too based on the storyline developing with uh with him and and uh, uh Omega and the potential that um their paths crossing uh later in the main event could uh, could entail but I don't know everybody's a pretty of the winners that are left uh everybody's a, well the two winners that are left and the two that have yet to be decided I don't see a bad bunch in the card. So, you know, I, I think uh, I think it's going to be pretty exciting with watching. Yeah, like I I definitely don't see Juice going on to win it all, but I, I would be very pleasantly surprised if he did. Um, Tanahashi, it's always hard to bet against him. Then again, he is so jacked up right now. Um, like in character and out of character, like there, there's obvious reasons to bet against him like out of character the, the dude is beat up he needs some time off i think uh in character suzuki has destroyed him on two separate occasions so like yeah I, i'm not surprised that he was included in the cup but I'm, I'm kind of a little surprised um and yeah abushi going on to win it all would would be really neat um could be an obvious bone of contention between kenny omega and cody rhodes um and also kind of play into the whole, is Ibushi part of the Bullet Club? Is he not kind of drama that's unfolding right now? Um, 
and I will never say no to a uh, to a, a big serious push for Sonata either because that dude is just straight up money. I honestly think that they should have pulled the trigger on him when he went after Okada last time. And I'd love to see a, a rematch scenario. I would love for Sonata to be the guy to take the title from Okada because God knows that needs to happen sooner rather than later. Sure. I mean, I was really hoping it was going to be Omega, but I think he's going to be busy. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like right now, I, most definitely. Um, I'm not exactly sure when the New Japan Cup is wrapping up. Um and I don't think that there is a window on when the cup winner has to pull the trigger and make their challenge. Um, and for that matter, the, the New Japan Cup is n- by no means a guarantee that you'll walk away victorious sure. at your title match. Because, um, I, yeah, I examined the, the record and it's pretty mixed on um, like whether or not the New, J- the New Japan Cup winner won or failed. Um, as a matter of fact... Tanahashi has won it twice, and the first time, I guess, was before this became uh, a thing where they won the right to challenge for a title, but the second time around, uh, he lost to Nakamura for for the uh, for the heavyweight title, and um, I guess while I'm looking at it, uh, a couple of interesting points of trivia, like Brock Lesnar defended against, uh, he was known as Giant Bernard at the time, but uh, Albert, A-Train, um, Matt Bloom. Like, firstly, Giant Bernard won a tournament in New Japan. Like, that's how big a deal he was over there. Uh, and he lost to Brock Lesnar in 2006. Um, just recently, Shibata won the New Japan Cup last year, and he lost to Okada for the title at uh, Sakura Genesis. So definitely not something you can count on. But, you know, it's it's something fun to watch all the same. It, it just injects something a little more interesting in what otherwise is kind of a a stale heavyweight singles title scene um, with Okada having been on top for going on two years now. Um, I guess you can't call it stale across the board because Suzuki did just take the title from Tanahashi and he didn't hold the Intercontinental title too long either. Um, Goto just recently won the never open weight title against Suzuki. Uh, shaved his head. But yeah, it's it's going to be a hell of a lot of fun. Uh, speaking of fun, let's talk about the exact inverse of that, uh, with, <laughs> with raw. Um, I, it, it's hard to look at anything that happened on raw and, and be stoked. Um, like perhaps the, the, the biggest argument to be made against that position was the news that the ultimate deletion is taking place next week. Um, there was some. Some back and forth from the Hardys, wherein he uh, brought the entirety of the Hardy clan into uh, the the Great War storyline. Uh, Queen Rebecca, King Maxwell, Lord Wolfgang, Senor Benjamin, Vanguard One. Uh, I think the Lake of Reincarnation and Skarsgård made an appearance as well. Yes. Yeah. So I I have a hard time getting excited about the Ultimate Deletion because. Like, they're just not putting a lot of emphasis on what I feel are the right things. Uh, say what you will about Impact, but they pushed the final deletion so hard that they actually sent advanced copies to the wrestling media uh, before it aired. Like, kind of like actual movie studios would. Like th- They were that gung-ho and on board with that storyline, with the whole Broken Universe deal. and. You know, WWE doesn't really commit to anything like that anymore. So it's it's hard for me to really get invested in this, especially since it's not going to be a mania thing. But, you know, there's still that part of me that saw the final deletion, saw all of that stuff over an impact and think maybe they can do that here with, with the resources available. How could they not? Right. Yeah, I mean, that that would seem to be the logic, not to mention the ever uh, stronger growing rumors that uh, not only I mean, it seems obvious that they at least have the rights right now. Uh, not only that, though, but uh, that it seems Jeremy Borash is on board and helping produce, which was one of the big reasons why it was successful in TNA. Um, it seems like all the pieces are there at the very least. Um, I would like to think that they're going to 
um, bring a couple of new things. They they seem to always do that when they when they go to the Hardy compound. Um, they they bring in a couple new elements uh, surrounding the outlying area that that just you know again that that sort of don't want to stare but can't look away awe and and amazement at what you might be seeing uh, during these events. Uh, I, I think the WWE has all the potential in the world to do it, but I do understand your hesitation because WWE is very well known for like. Uh, you know, that whole look, see, see, we're doing it kind of mentality where it's, it's a shell of what it was when it, when it first arrived. And Lord knows that's how, uh, Matt Hardy especially has been treated. And, and one can make an argument that Bray Wyatt has also been treated, uh, throughout his career as well. Um, see the House of Horrors match. But, mm-hmm. <laughs> but, you know, Putting putting the taking the creativity completely out of well not completely I'm assuming but at least more out of uh, the creative team's hand and putting it into the hands of Matt Bray and you know possibly Jerry Borash and you know all the people that that are good at making this stuff work I think is a smart decision so if that's what's happening then you know I'm I'm going to be cautiously optimistic about it. Yeah, it's it's just. Again, it's really hard to be optimistic when you see a headline on WWE.com uh, and, and I quote, Woken Matt Hardy meets with a wise giraffe before the ultimate deletion and and them not going with the gimmick like this was George Washington that Hardy was speaking with. And he, he carries on conversations with Smoke and Joe Frazier in between training sessions and and. You know, like that whole shtick. Why you wouldn't put in a headline, Matt Hardy converses with George Washington before the ultimate deletion. Like, if nothing else, that would generate clicks because people look at that and what the fuck? How? It is so weird how they can take something that is just handed to them on a silver platter. Something that grabbed not just wrestling media, but mainstream media by the throat and it just squeeze for all it was worth and like they, they, they managed to piss it away like this uh, it's it is primo wwe like, that that's i think that about sums it up uh but elsewhere on raw um you know the the saga of roman versus brock lesnar thus far it, it's been interesting how they've cast roman um, not exactly like the, the everyman that Daniel Bryan was, and it, they haven't even tried making him Samoan Cena this time around. I, I think they've actually hit on something where Roman is still cast as the guy you're supposed to get behind, but it, it's Roman in a way that works. The, uh, no nonsense badass that really wants to fucking fight Brock Lesnar and is frustrated as hell that he can't, that he can't even talk with him, that his opponent for Mania won't even show up to the show. And I think this week's installment was oddly constructed. Um, like it, 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 it was the workiest shoot I've ever seen where yeah. he storms into Vince's office and, and Shane's there and, and like they, they go close doors and then and Vince walks out and says, "Well, oh, you disrespected me. Don't do that. Uh, uh, shut your mouth and know your role." Like his cousin knew the, knew the knew the deal. Uh, so I'm I'm suspending him temporarily. Uh, coincidentally, just in time for Brock to show up uh, next week. That is, but yeah, on the whole, I I do like the way they're casting Roman. I I think it's I think it's smart. It's definitely a damn sight better than the whole, well, Cena says he's a guy. Daniel Bryan says he's a guy. The Rock says he's a guy. The Undertaker says he's a guy. You, you got to like him now, right? It's it's letting Roman play a little more to his strengths, I feel. And he might be talking a little too much uh, and giving himself more of an opportunity to kind of hang himself with the rope he's been given. But he hasn't screwed up yet. So I like that at least I I am enjoying. I I agree completely. I think letting Roman be Roman, you know, it's it's being mentioned in the live chat 
that, you know, he he wasn't cutting a promo that was on script. I don't know if that's necessarily uh, well. true. I, I Again, I don't know if that's necessarily true, but it sounded like it wasn't on script. And that's the important part. Um, mm-hmm. Letting letting Roman, you know, feel like, you know, get his frustrations out to, to a certain extent and feel like a real person rather than the big dog, the guy who ended the Undertaker streak, the guy who, you know, eliminated the most people in, in – the Royal Rumble or lasted the longest at Survivor Series or against four other people and blah, blah, blah. You know, those things, I think they're great accolades. But when that's the only thing that you're hanging your hat on is, you know, uh, how many how many different uh, records you've broken and nothing else. I mean, it doesn't work. We've seen it time and time again. How many times has Big Show lifted something really heavy or – uh, Mark Henry done some incredible feat of strength and that's all they got. It's, it's one note and it's flat and it doesn't work. And that's part of the reason why people go against Roman so much is because it's another flat one dimensional character that, that nobody wants to get behind anymore. And they're, they're putting their foot down finally. So giving him that dimension, I definitely think helps. I will say, uh, out of the other side of my mouth that I think it's, it's extremely ironic that you have Roman say, I'm tired of Brock, Vince's guy, getting all the, the fucking preferential treatment around here. I think that might have been a little bit of a, a, a not good choice in, in what yeah. Roman could say. But, you know, I'm willing to let that, you know, in a way nitpick. Uh, aside for for what we're seeing here, I also think it's really smart to keep uh, Brock and Roman away from each other leading up to Mania. I mean, that's that's how booking used to be. You know, look at just about any huge marquee match from uh, the Rock and Wrestling area. Those guys barely even stood in the same room, let alone talked to each other or laid hands on each other before their matches, and that built. Uh, suspense and and anticipation for when the match actually started. I think that's also extremely smart. I'm not saying it can never work. I mean, look at SmackDown and, and AJ and Shinsuke's work. I think that also builds anticipation. But I think in this case, especially doing this again, I think this is what works. This is what makes it feel slightly different than it was the last time. It also helps Roman out, makes him look like a more rounded character, and it builds that anticipation and uh, suspense for the match ahead. So, yeah, I'm in full agreement. I think uh, for the most part, this is a good way to build this storyline. Yeah, and something that you said earlier, I I think, raises a good point. It's something that the WWE stumbles across every now and again, but it doesn't seem like they've actually figured out that numbers do not make the man. It doesn't matter who you beat, how many accolades you have you have uh, gained to your name. There's got to be a character there aside from that. Like yes. Brock traded on being the one in 21 and one for a little while there. But Heyman does such a good job of building, of using that to build up Brock as the baddest man in, 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 in fight. Like just, just plain old fighting, yeah. not sports entertainment, not wrestling, not just UFC, like the, the baddest fighter to walk the earth. Yeah. He's, and, he's the, the, best living embodiment in the modern day of a fucking Spartan or something like that is how yeah is is how uh Heyman spins it and I think that's very good. Yeah, and that should be something you you ought to be able to do with Roman. Uh but yeah, so often they have they they've dropped the ball. And like that's that's something they've done with other guys like that. Like uh if the WWE had its way, they and just their narrative mattered, Daniel Bryan would absolutely be a victim of that. Yeah. Because, like, I I revisit the moment uh, in Survivor Series where Daniel Bryan and Stephen McMahon are, are jawjacking at each other over, well, who's going to come out on top? Is it going to be Kurt or is it going to be Shane? And Daniel's talking about how he beat Triple H and now he's going to give that to the whole SmackDown roster. And and Stephanie got in the little jab. Yeah, the time you beat my husband and won WrestleMania, that was your only big moment. 
like that is the WWE narrative about Daniel Bryan. Like if it wasn't also for the fan narrative, I don't know that Daniel Bryan would have been as big a deal as he wound up being. Yeah. So, yeah, again, like the WWE stumbles across some success in building a character every now and again, but it's just something they haven't figured out. I I'm, I'm just glad that they finally stumbled across it with Roman. Like the guy that they have been trying to push for so long. Like the the arc archetypical Vince's guy like you yeah. said before right and it's it's unfortunate because it's not the first time that we've seen you know uh this Roman being Roman thing work you know I will always go back to you know the raw that that got rained out where they kind of had to just improvise because you know so much of their production was was halted by the storm and Roman just did a fucking the simplest you know, I mean, it, it, it was one on one when it started, then it ended up being face to face and all that stuff. But just a simple to the camera with with uh, uh, Michael Cole being being a guide with questions and stuff. Simple promo. And yet that was possibly the realest and best promo I've seen from Roman. So if they've stumbled across this idea with Roman a couple of times over his career, but they just can't let that narrative go that they need a Cena all the time. They need a rock all the time. They need a Hogan all the time. They need, you know, those larger than life guys, uh, at every time, at every turn. And the, the downside is the reason that all three of those men got over was because they had, their own spin on what it could be. And yeah, is Cena stale now? Is Hogan stale now? Is Rock stale now? Yeah, because we've seen it for a couple of years. But what immediately made them spark with the fans was what they brought to the table, not what was put upon them as a blueprint. Sorry, Matt Morgan. So do that. Let Roman be Roman. Don't make him be the next Cena, Rock, Hogan. Let, let him be the current Roman. That's what works. That's what works with everybody. Absolutely. Oh, as an aside, I miss Matt Morgan, man. <laughs> yeah, he was pretty cool. Yeah. I, I will admit, I laughed at the uh, the stuttering Matt Morgan gimmick. I, I was like 15, though. <laughs> yeah, the, the WWE never really treated that dude right. No. I, I, I like this stuff in Impact. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I did, too. Uh, let's see. Oh, damn, that would have been a good segue for the ultimate deletion. Um, <laughs> but we already talked about it. So <laughs> speaking of WrestleMania plans, Cena has one last shot at a road to WrestleMania. Only one more. Mm -hmm. And that's the Undertaker. So long story short, John Cena got drunk on TV and challenged Taker to a match. <laughs> uh... Like, that's essentially what happened, it yeah. seemed like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's probably his first sip of beer in a long-ass time, let's be honest. Yeah, there, there's that. no <laughs> way that dude drinks anything but the finest of wines. Yeah, you don't get that physique by drinking beer every day, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> no, and, and as much of a work as Total Divas is, like I think that him being as uptight and regimented as he, as he has shown, yeah. I think that is legit real. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah, I don't know, man, about this promo. Like, I'm really on the fence about it. On the one hand, I begrudgingly admit that I was kind of swept up into the hype of it um, in general. Yeah, not necessarily any specific word or phrase that he said, but the hype of building to uh, – Taker versus Cena at Mania, like I, I felt it. I'll, I'll give you, I'll give that to Cena uh, any day of the week that he's a fucking great hype man and he's good mm -hmm. at fucking, you know, stirring that, stirring up the anthill, so to speak. Um, that all said, I really don't like the check your ego uh, narrative that he was playing. You know, I, I, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I get some points i suppose but let's be honest here i mean doing doing a, a tough workout that you post on your wife's instagram is far and away different from working a match you know it's it's easy to push yourself in the gym and and well i mean to certain lengths it's easy i mean depending on how far you're pushing yourself but it's it's a lot easier to do that than it is to work a match in front of 70,000 plus people do I think that Kate Taker is capable of working a match still? 
I do, honestly. I think if he's smart about it and chooses the the spots correctly, I've seen I've seen people in far worse condition do far better uh, in wrestling matches before. So I do think that Taker could work it. Should he? Does he need to? Mm, I don't know. I don't know for sure. I I don't think so. Ultimately, um, I'm sure it'll be a spectacle of a match. I actually think that Cena would do better, uh, not much, but better to protect uh, Taker's image than Roman would. I just think he has a little bit more seasoned veteran expertise. I don't necessarily want to be called a hypocrite from last week's show, though. So ultimately, I I don't think it's going to be like a marked improvement or something super huge. Uh, and I don't know. I mean, I, I, it's gotta happen. You know, I don't think they would let this, it's just like Cena said, if this wasn't going to happen, they would have shut off his mic or something. If they thought that this, this hype was too real for them to live up to any expectation of. Um, so it's gotta happen. The Undertaker's name's been put in Cena's mouth several times now, um, including over just this one promo. Uh, so it's, it's to me a sign and sealed deal at this point. Um, I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, uh, there's the fan in me wants to see Taker wrestle forever and ever and ever because I love the gimmick. I love, even with the streak broken, I think his, uh, mystery, well, not mystery, but this mysticism, I guess, uh, put around WrestleMania, like they're synonymous to me. Like they go hand in hand. And I'll also admit in that same breath that I, uh, I was prepared this, this, uh, this WrestleMania, you know, I was prepared that this was going to be, you know, not because of injury, not because of inactiveness, not because of whatever, like, surely and finally this was going to be the wrestlemania that we didn't see taker and the wrestlemania that would mark all wrestlemanias going forward because we will never see rest we'll never see taker wrestle at a wrestlemania again i was prepared for that may have taken me the better part of the year to get prepared for it but i was and now you know it seems almost like there will never be an end to it and that that brings up so much conflict in me that I don't think I even have enough time on this show to, to work it out. Um, so I don't know. Like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of an emotional wreck about this. <laughs> yeah. I, I do think it's interesting that Cena told Taker to take this match and check his ego at the door in the process as though Taker's ego is what's keeping him yeah. from coming to mania when in fact taker's ego is the reason that he keeps coming back that in the fat ass payday that he gets but like eh, the, the adulation just, of the fans too uh, but mm. like okay i i don't know Th- this match should not be happening like, 10 years ago this would have been a fantastic match i would argue that 5 years ago this would have been Maybe better than Bray versus Taker. Maybe better than Reigns versus Taker. But now in 2018, I I seriously question Taker's ability to work a match. Like, not put it together or anything like that, but the ability to execute upon it. He's had some surgery since last year, so maybe he's in better shape now. But we never see the guy, really. So it's it's really hard to tell. Can he actually do a match like this justice? Can he can he do better than he did last year, the last few years? I don't know. And I'm I'm kind of tired of having to wait and see every year. Like, is this one where Taker can actually get the job done? <laughs> yeah, I I don't know. I, I'm definitely not stoked to see this match. Um I, I was definitely prepared for this to be a takerless mania. I think, honestly, the show would be better for it because at some point, Taker's gonna, Taker's not gonna be with us anymore, and you have to have a takerless mania at some point. Yeah, but at this point, it would not surprise me in the slightest for them to keep dragging his ass back for one more match. Yeah, I mean, and then it's like we were kind of speculating last week, like what really is left after this? You know, I, I guess, yep. I like I said last week, I guess Taker Sting, but I think you'd still have to book that 
exceptionally better. You know, it, honestly, Sting would not be able to take a bump like so, that. That would be a, a primary stipulation. The first rule about that match: Sting cannot bump. Yeah, for sure. And and it would make me feel like they would have to book uh, potentially a more serious uh, version of the uh, of the uh, final slash ultimate deletion type stuff. Um, I don't know. I don't know if Taker and Sting would be into that. Um, I certainly would be, um, but I, I don't think many, many others would. And I don't know if they could even pull it off then. You know, I still think there's a certain physicality that is demanded of even, you know, shoots like that. So I don't know, man. I don't know. Like, I, I hope I hope that if this is well, when this happens, it is truly the last thing. You know, as as much as the supernatural wrestling fan in me would like to see Sting Taker, I just don't think you can push for it or, or frankly, anyone else. You know, I, I don't see the need for it anymore. You know, the streak's broken. He's given the rub to Roman. He's he's I mean, there's what what else? <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a hallmark of this show for people to talk about how Tager's last opponent absolutely needs to be Kane. And they both need to take each other to hell on their way out the door. But That's yeah, fair. realistically speaking, yeah, I don't know if it could there's nothing happen. left the, like, Taker. It, it is questionable whether he should still be working sting. There's no way in hell that he should be working. Um, and I, I, I do think sting would be a lot more amenable to the idea of a final deletion type match than, than you might expect. Cause you know, he yeah. got up to some pretty goofy shit in impact. Like sure. he, he pushed the boundaries of his character a lot. Taker, I don't see going for that at all. Because as many evolutions as he went through with the gimmick, he was always a serious character. He, well, and I he definitely didn't allude take to liberties like that. Right. And I definitely allude to a more serious tone than, yeah, than but the final deletion. Like it, with a with a with the crow versus the Undertaker, basically. Yeah. Like it, there would be unbelievable elements to that match. Like, I don't know sure. that Taker would go for that. Sure, that's that's a fair point. So, Cena versus Taker. It's, it's gonna happen. happen. Yeah, it's, there's no um, way it's not happening. Yeah. And... Unless, unless... I, I hate to do it. I gotta bring the Spectre back. Unless... Do you think this could possibly be the Cena heel turn? All this hype, never to get Taker, turn Cena heel. How? I mean, every him talking so much about this Taker match, and then like you find out at WrestleMania or something. Yeah, Taker's not here. I worked all you guys. Oh, like this has all been one massive yeah. work on Cena's part, just to, like right. jerk us around. Yeah, I, I mean, it doesn't take much for Cena to get booed, but sure, I, I <laughs> teasing a Taker appearance. Like, yeah, I, I could see that. Um, I, I don't think it happens, but you know, no, all possibilities on the table, I suppose. <laughs> I mean, never count out WWE's ability to do dumb shit, especially on the grandest stage of them all. But yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, we we've seen Taker's beard get dyed. He, he's gearing up for another sure. match. Oh sure, no, I, I, it's happening. Oh, uh, let's see. Um, Rollins squared off with Balor for whatever reason, leading up to their triple threat match for the IC title. Uh, I, I think the only thing really of note here is that somebody got pinned off the superplex and it wasn't the guy that took it. Um, like the way Balor rolled Rollins up after the impact on the superplex. Um, I don't know that anybody has ever won a match like that before. Cause theoretically, you should be able to, because the person executing the superplex gets as jacked up as a guy taking it. Right. So, and, and like, that's completely within kayfabe. Like, the superplex is supposed to be a, this utterly devastating move to both victim sure. and, and executor. But, yeah, for, I, I suppose I understand why it's never been Orton that, that suffered that fate, because it's Randy Orton, and, you know, why would he ever lay down for somebody? But, yeah, I, I just thought that was weird. It possibly might have happened in the Bob Orton days, like get one over on the heel. Um, but I think that's that's hard to <laughs> to nail down. I don't think it's ever happened on like 
as grand a scale as like in the middle of the ring on Raw. Yeah. Um, and then I I believe this was the main event. I don't I don't remember, but um, yes, it, it was a hundred percent the main event. So earlier in the show, the bar were crowing about how oh, there's nobody left for us to face, and we beat everybody. And then the entire tag team division poured out and started beating the shit out of them. Um. Seamus tried to beg off from from Titus Worldwide by throwing out the Wakanda Forever sign at him, and like yeah, that was real <laughs> weird. But uh, they got the shit beat out of him, and then there was a battle royal booked, and Braun showed up and declared himself to be a part of the match by himself, and so obviously he proceeded to bury the entire division and win the match and secure himself a title match at WrestleMania against the Bar. Apparently, officially speaking, it hasn't been signed off on, but. Again, this is WWE. Never underestimate their their ability to do dumb shit at Mania. Yeah. So. <laughs> no, I I 100 agree with you. I the only and, and and still not a great solution to this, but I would like to see Kurt stick hard and fast, and at the very least force Braun to attain a tag team partner if he's going to challenge for the tag titles. Because it's egregious if they're going to let Braun not only fucking decimate the entire division on his own, which I get it. He's the monster among men. Get these hands. I get it. By the way, that fucking promo where he talked to the camera and they like fucking actually physically put words on the fucking screen for what like highlights of what he was saying was fucking dumb. Um, But moving aside from that, squashing the entire fucking tag team roster on raw, uh, come on, man. And then if you let him go forward and win the tag team titles by themselves, I mean, Raw's tag team division was already fucking on life support to begin with. Might as well just fucking nail that coffin now. Uh, it's it's uh, it's it's a bummer. And it bugs me because, you know, you got AOP in fucking NXT. And I know they're involved in the Dusty Classic and shit, but let's be honest. They don't really need to be. I mean, they've pretty Absolutely much done all. Yeah, they've pretty much done all they can in NXT, and I think that would be a great Mania match, AOP debuting against the bar. They say they've beaten all the other teams a million fucking times. Here's a new, badass, barely ever been pinned team. You know, let's see what happens. Plus fucking Ellering's there. So... Why are we doing this stupid shit? And it's it's hurtful to Braun too. He went from a challenger to fucking uh, to to fucking Brock Lesnar uh, to fucking fending for the tag titles by himself. Come on, guys, you're better than this. Fucking better than this. Yeah, it, I'm completely on board with you in how they're destroying their tag team division. But no matter what happens, it again treats the raw tag team titles as a mockery. I, I I want just once for those belts to be held by an actual team. And no no matter who you throw in there, because like Beanbags is throwing out Elias, Ishmael's throwing out Kane. I, I actually thought I saw at one point that it was official that Strowman and Kane are going to be facing the bar, but I, I can't find that anywhere. And uh, like you said, Braun is a legitimate world title contender, and going into Mania, he's on track to have a shitty tag team title run. That's fucking bonkers to me. And, but yeah, AOP makes so much sense, because they are beyond ready to move up, have been for months, and they're... They're mishandling the shit out of the Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic in NXT. We can touch on that in a little bit. But out of everybody, like you still got the Revival. You still got the club. Those are two very legitimate tag teams, or at least they could be if you'd stop cutting the legs out from under them at every chance you get. Titus Worldwide. Like, you had something going there before you just had them lose in a title match out of nowhere. Heath Slater and Rhino. That's a weird as hell team, but they have a track record of success. They were the first ever SmackDown Tag Team Champions. If you treated them with any kind of legitimacy, instead of giving Heath Slater the only prominent screen time as host of Game Fight, then maybe you could do something there. But they're, they're, 
for whatever reason, they're so in love with the idea of Sheamus and Cesaro as tag team champions that they can't book an actual feud to save their life. And I, I love what Sheamus and Cesaro ha have put together as a tag team. But I, I want an actual story going on. I want a, a feud going on. I want something on the order of what we used to see in NXT with a tag team scene. Uh, coincidentally, when the revival was involved. And the fact that, again, I, it is so weird. I I was beginning to think that we would never see a point where they, they pulled the rug out from under Braun to see how he would react just because of how over he was. But they did it. They fucking did it. They bailied him. And I <laughs> I don't get how somebody they were so high on is now suffering this fate. God, it's so weird. Yeah. Uh and just weirdness is a can be an apt descriptor for Raw right now, because like yeah. I, that's everything of note as far as I can recall. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's really the important stuff. I guess I guess we could touch on uh, Nia Jax and Alexa, if you wanted to. Yeah, I, I guess. So, I mean, it's looking like the program is going to be Nia versus Alexa at Mania. Um, because Oscar went after Charlotte out of fucking nowhere. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> like, sure, it makes sense. Uh, Alexa has been engaging in this weird backhanded support with with Nia. Uh, I don't like the the callbacks to Karma versus the Bella Twins that I keep seeing. Yeah, but you know, it, Nia going after Alexa makes sense overall. So it's certainly not the worst they could have done. Far from it. Sure. Um, I just want Nia to look like a a badass. Like I like that she is showing that she's capable of emotion, that she is a real human being. But this feels a little too karma esque for for my liking. Yeah, I, I would have liked to see the similar range of emotion that we saw uh, from from Rousey at, at her contract sizing, signing. You know, I don't mind uh, seeing Nia share a few tears, but I think by the end of it, um, I, listen, being being human and being upset about things, I totally understand, but she is portraying a fictional character. And I think the fictional character needs to look strong and dominant by the end. So I don't mind her, you know, being upset about the things that Alexa was saying, but I think by the end of that shot, we should go from, you know, ugly cry grimace to fucking death stare. Like I'm not just going to fucking let Alexa talk shit to me and make me feel bad emotionally. You know, I'm going to own my emotions and I'm going to use them to fucking destroy her. That's the fucking narrative I want to see. Yeah, and, and they kind of got at that. Uh, it took Alexa and Mickey being caught off guard by all their shit talk being caught on camera and then Nia stormed in to destroy Alexa. But yeah, for like three weeks, it was nothing but but crying and sobbing from Nia. Really, that was that was uncomfortable after a while. Excuse me. Sorry. Um, but yeah, I, I think that pretty much covers everything from Raw. I think we can transition into SmackDown. Yeah. Uh, not that not that a ton of stuff happened on SmackDown really. Um, some of it was was Fastlane Fallout. Um, I, I guess we start with the tag team scene. Yeah. Um, so at Fastlane, we had a title match between. The New Day and the Usos, which was shaping up incredibly well. And to to close out that match, the Usos were not victorious. The New Day was not victorious. They were interrupted by, by the Bludgeon Brothers, of all people. And the Bludgeon Brothers just absolutely destroyed everyone left in front of them, which I, I have issues with. But on SmackDown... It turned out that Big E and Jimmy Uso were the only two out of the five that were cleared to compete. So they teamed up against Harper and Rowan and were promptly run through. Uh, destroyed post-match and all of that. 
the Bludgeon Brothers left their mark. Now, I, I have my own issues with the team of the Bludgeon Brothers. I, I hate their theme. I am not crazy about their gear. The hammers, I think, are kind of dumb. Because if you're that much of an engine of destruction, then why aren't you using the hammers? Um, I, I did enjoy seeing what they did to the New Day and the Usos, like, just by itself. Like, I think it was good, dominant monster heel stuff. But it's the New Day versus the Usos, man. Like, why ruin that with just this extraneous bullshit? Why couldn't you do this on the pre-show? Because it's not like Brizongo and Ty Dillinger versus Mojo, Gable, and Benjamin was lighting the world on fire. Like, and that's objectively more impressive, d destroying six people as opposed to five. Like, why couldn't you do that there and have them then stake their claim to the tag team titles on the SmackDown after? Like, I, I don't, I don't get that. I don't like it. So I, for for them to just continue this on SmackDown, sure, whatever. But I, I, I just don't like how this particular angle kicked off. I, uh, I, I politely and respectfully have to disagree with you here, Nick. Um, I, I actually really like, I mean, I didn't like that the Bludgeon Brothers interrupted a potential another barn vendor, uh, barn burner from, uh, the Usos on the New Day. Um, yet, I have to admit, like, kind of like we were alluding to with Cena teasing Taker only for him not to be there, uh, it's a pretty good heel move, I think. I mean, they're not trying to be loved by people. They're trying to fuck up, you know, the, the tag champions and the uh, would-be contenders. So I think that kind of makes some at least storytelling sense, even though it's still, at the very end of the day, not exactly – ideal for the uh the tenants of the closure of the match um i you know i i, I haven't really paid too much attention to their theme um their gear i will admit when i first saw it i wasn't in love with i didn't absolutely hate it but i wasn't in love with it it's kind of grown on me i i like the attempt to kind of make the uh make harper and rowan their own thing it's not just you know, two guys who, you know, even if they'd been away for months, years even from Bray Wyatt, it's not two guys that were remnants of the Wyatt family anymore. One in a jumpsuit and the other looking like a greasy fucking backwoods mechanic. Uh, they, they look like their own unit now. They look like their own thing. And I, I like that. You know, the hammers are a big gimmicky. Um, I do like that they've at least teased using them. Um, and have attempted to strike people with them, but usually they have enough wherewithal to get out of the way, which I think builds towards, um, you know, it's it's like, will Stephanie get pedigreed in, in the storyline between Triple H and Chris Jericho? It, it builds towards when that moment will finally happen. Um, and I honestly think that, it, I mean, taking the gimmick of the Bludgeon Brothers away, knowing the uh additional barn burners that have been put on by the Usos and Harper and Rowan uh in the past. Uh and I think they've wrestled the New Day as well, um, as Harper and Rowan too. Adding all three of these teams together, like it, it kind of gets me salivating at the mouth a little bit. You know, I, I also kinda like the the storyline that there are there are two survivors who are gonna put their their own business on hold to handle a common, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, a common enemy, enemy in, uh, in the Bludgeon Brothers. So, I mean, I, I'm enjoying the storyline and I, I think the match itself will be a pretty good payoff too. Um, but I, I also digress a bit. And it's not like anything that happened, either at Fastlane or on SmackDown, doesn't make sense from a storyline perspective. Like, obviously, the Bludgeon Brothers are going to walk in and do whatever they want. That's that's the gimmick. I, I get that. I I don't understand why the WWE wrote this storyline in the first place. Because Fastlane was already not going to be anything to write home about. That match could easily have been its saving grace. And instead, you had to stink up the joint with a no contest 
Like you couldn't have the Usos retain triumphantly, or you couldn't have the New Day go on to become five time, five, five time t- tag team champions. You had to have everything in controversy and, and everything just go to hell in a handbasket and have the Usos and the New Day just get utterly stomped into the floor, except for that one moment where suddenly an Uso came to life just long enough to jump out of the way of a hammer strike. Like, that's what I have problem with. Just the short-sightedness of the WWE in general. I think that they'll go on to have a pretty good match. Because I, I, I have to imagine it's going to be a triple threat at Mania. Yeah. Uh, it, it'll probably be one of two options with which to open the show. That or Nakamura versus Styles for the title. But, yeah, it, it's just... I, I just don't like the way... It kicked off. Like, I don't like how it was was laid out. I, I honestly think it should have all started to unfold last night on SmackDown rather than on Sunday. Um, the other big thing, I guess, uh, was Shane getting written off TV um, for I, – I don't think he really gave a reason, but he is taking an indefinite leave of absence as the commissioner. Uh, he also said Daniel Bryan's going to be back on TV starting next week, but uh, his last act as commissioner, I guess, was to book Owens and Zayn against each other at Mania, and uh, that prompted uh, the, the uh, swift and appropriate ass-kicking at the hands of Owens and Zayn. Um, they laid a hurting on Shane. That was kind of the, the closer for the show, and uh, yeah, Shane's going to be out for the foreseeable future. Again, I don't know why, but... And and it does kind of call into question whether or not Owens and Zayn actually are working each other at Mania, because it, it feels like that wasn't necessarily official. Like, did, did he book it before he took his leave of absence, or uh, did he just kind of say that as a uh, out of the door, fuck you? Like, I don't know. I find it highly spu- suspect if, if Kane, uh, Kane, Shane is, uh, <laughs> sorry. Their names sound similar, know. man. Yeah, um, absolutely. <laughs> if I'm glad we weren't doing the show when they were feuding. Uh, if if uh, my, I'm very suspect at the fact that that Shane will be written off of TV all the way to Mania. Um, it's possible. I mean, he sold that powerbomb into whatever the heck that was pretty damn well. Like I was generally concerned for its well being. He he was. Yeah, I hope that was selling. Um, because whatever that thing was looked very, very hard and not pleasant to be powerbombed on. Even if you're having two people that are fairly good hands in the ring, you know, guiding you towards it. Uh, I don't know, man. I've heard rumors that this could get, you know, as as it was being said in the live chat, it seems like a lot of storylines this year are, are starting to be built, built towards triple threats. I wouldn't be surprised if this was one of them, too. You know, if we saw a Owens versus Zane versus Shane... Uh oh, God, Zane too, man. That's gonna. Thank God, there's never gonna be Zane versus Kane versus Shane. Uh, that would just blow my mind up. Uh, but uh, yeah, I could definitely see some sort of triple threat match happening uh, from this result. Um, maybe handicap or something. I don't know. I don't know. Um, Shane's been involved in pretty much every WrestleMania since he's been back, so I don't see why he wouldn't be involved in this one. Barring that he wasn't actually hurt. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a weird storyline, to say the least. <laughs> I do have to wonder if this isn't just prelude to a buildup for him being in a match. Um, be it a triple threat against Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn, or, I mean, this would be a long shot, but a tag team match between Owens and Zayn against him and Debray. Uh, um, it's possible, or Shane could find another, you know, partner that WWE isn't afraid to take off of the inactive list. Yeah, like that's what I was thinking. Like, but who would be his partner? Um, Big Show, do- <laughs> maybe. Huh. I mean, they have a history. Yeah, it wouldn't be exciting, but no, it uh, absolutely I mean- would not. But um, <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm trying to remember. Show's not. He is not retired. Been- and I'm pretty sure yeah, he's still like, on the active roster. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was wondering about because yeah. he's I'm been gone positive. for a long I'm not, time. I'm not totally sure, but I'm pretty positive he's still on the active roster. Yeah, um, it up. was Mark Henry that said he was retired as an active performer. 
Yes. So, yeah, I mean, can't rule out Big Show, I guess. Um, Never can with tag matches. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to imagine anybody else on the on the roster right now, because Nakamura is tied up with AJ. Orton is U.S. champ, and he's going to be fighting Bobby and uh, Gender. Ty Dillinger doesn't feel like a big enough deal. Um, I would love that, but yeah, yeah, and, and it would kind of come out of left field too. But I mean, I'd still be into it. Yeah, because it's not like he doesn't have a grievance because they kicked the shit out of him back at the Rumble and Sammy took a spot. But sure, yeah, I, I just don't see who else would be that partner. Yeah, uh, should a tag team match be in the works? I, I, I would think the most likely option would be a triple threat between those three guys. Like maybe D Bry's a referee or like he's ringside or something. Yeah, yeah, but, I could see that. Uh, Some I sort could, of narrative where I think they're they're all involved in a match somehow. Yeah. Huh. In the live chat it was brought it was just brought up that Dolph can maybe be his partner. Which That seems also out of left field. Yeah, especially since he's been a heel in the build with the fast lane, but then like two weeks before uh two weeks before fast lane he was a face for well, whatever reason. Let's let's not be uh coy here. They've been playing playing pretty fast and loose as to who is a heel and who is a face in this whole storyline to begin with. So uh, the, <laughs> the lead up to Fastlane, Dolph pulled the whole what's the matter with the AJ? You used to be cool like me and Pretty obvious heel shit. Yeah, show's still um, on the roster, by the way. I'll yeah. Um, I, I don't know. It's going to be weird and dumb, whatever it is, because it's going to force some kind of conflict between Kevin and Sammy um, d- just because it's them. And sure, they obviously haven't known what to do with Kevin and Sammy for months now. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, since this whole storyline began, that was one thing that also kind of bothered me that is tied into this. Uh, Sammy's little backstage interview last night, um, I guess he kind of sort of suggests, I mean, he at least suggested that, uh, since the five way at, on SmackDown that he was working Owens, but kind of also had like a pseudo suggestion that he's been working Owens all along. Like the whole plan was to save Owens at, at Hell in a Cell. Well, he didn't actually come out and say that, but this is me thinking it. His whole plan was to save Owens a hell in a cell and then like warm up to him and uh you know when the opportunity came stab him in the back so to speak which I'm not going to say is a terrible plan but that's not really the narrative that's been playing you know uh um, yeah, like that hasn't been Sammy yeah and any time that that I think they've planted some sort of seeds that that might be the narrative uh, it always seems like it gets uh, overshadowed by Shane's involvement in the storyline altogether. Like, I feel like uh, Sammy's little thing at the Rumble, where he said, don't worry, Kevin, I got this, and then got eliminated. I think that was supposed to kind of factor into, you know, some sort of dissension in the ranks or something, or maybe him showing his cards a little too early or something. I don't know. But we didn't really focus on that past in the moment of the match itself, because then Shane came back again and said, hey, blah, 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 I'm Shane McMahon and I hate you both. And blah. And, and mm-hmm. I don't know, this whole storyline has just been so muddled and odd, you know, that honestly, I, like last night when I was waiting for Shane's announcement, uh, I just kind of wanted to see what the grand conclusion of this storyline was going to be. Um, partly because I, I can't wait for it to be over <laughs> and partly because I, I just want to see like where they always plan to end up. And I still don't feel like it's a totally great place. It's too confusing. There's not – you need a protagonist and antagonist in a story like this. Moral lines can be skewed as all get out. But you need someone that you're pulling for to be victorious and someone that you're pulling for to lose. And I don't feel like there's really any odd, I guess, pull for Shane because he's been wrong so many times or pull for Sammy because he's trying to come out from – being an underdog or I don't know at all why, you, what narrative you could create to pull for Kevin up to this point, other than being screwed by Sammy maybe, but I don't know. It's, it's too gray area. I think it's I, just, it's too much gray area. I, I don't think there's any gray area as far as who's a good guy and who's a bad guy in this story. Cause Shane 
is the asshole here. Uh, comparatively speaking, like Kevin absolutely has a lot of valid points. Sammy has a lot of valid points. Like Shane inserts himself into everything to the detriment of the product. And like the shit he pulled at Fastlane. Uh, screwing both Kevin and Sammy out of what would have been match-ending pinfalls. It, but it's gotten to the point now that I don't care about an angle that involves both Kevin Owens and Sammy Zayn. I I cannot be bothered because Shane is just always there. He's always being a dickhead, and like, I don't care about Shane. I never have, and I. I welcome the idea of him being off my TV. I, I relish the thought of one less McMahon being on my TV. Granted, Vince is on TV now, so it essentially bounces out. But at least SmackDown could be free of Shane for at least a couple weeks until he comes back to unleash righteous vengeance upon Kevin and Sammy and book himself into a triple threat. <laughs> What's sad, too, is like Shane is supposed to be the good McMahon, right? Like... He's the yeah. one, you know, taking kayfabe aside. He's the one giving people actual opportunities and letting letting storylines digest on their own and taking an input from people and whatnot. And and you know, yet when it comes to storylines of his own, they're almost always as a story garbage. I still think AJ versus Shane was a great match last year. Great match, sure. But the build up to it was terrible. <laughs> and and the same with. Him and Taker. And, and you know, I, I don't think he's had a great story since maybe he was hardcore champion way back at the early aughts. So, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> at the end of the day, a McMahon is a McMahon is a McMahon. And the point there is they're shitty, shitty people. They, inevit they invariably, at least over the last decade or so, make a storyline worse than what it could be. And then... I, I I I I don't care about Kevin or Sammy right now. Like, how fucking weird is that statement? And yet, it is a thing. They have made me stop caring about what's going on with Kevin and Sammy. I thought that'd be one of the impossible things to do. But every time I begin to think that, like, how do you fuck up Bailey? How do you fuck up Braun Strowman? How do you fuck up Kevin and Sammy? They manage it. <sighs> yeah. And what's also sad is regardless of what match, because I, I think Kevin and Sammy will uh, wrestle each other, whether there's someone else added or it's just a singles match or they got a special referee, whatever. The thing is, I know, again, just like AJ versus Shane last year, that match is going to be great. That match is probably going to be the best WWE's Kevin versus Sammy match we've ever seen because it, it's not just them. It's them fighting each other at WrestleMania. We should be really excited about that. Yeah. And nope. <laughs> but it's WrestleMania, so we got to get excited about everything. Yeah. This is a big easy going down in New Orleans like Kid Rock fucking says. God <laughs> damn it. Uh, um, I think this is but as hey. good a time as any to break down uh, Fastlane or late results. But uh, you sure. were about to say something. I was also going to say just a little injection of, of positivity once more, at least an attempt. We're getting uh, we're getting Nakamura versus AJ. <laughs> so that's always yeah. cool. <laughs> yeah, the match is going to be great. It's going to be either an opener or a cooldown match, but the match itself is going to be great. I don't I, – wherever they put it on the card, I think the crowd goes to fucking nuts for it, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> it, it will be a main event in my heart. Um – yeah, the fast lane. Uh, we've alluded to a lot of it, but um, there was a pre-show match between Rizongo and Ty Dillinger versus uh, American Alpha 2.0 and Mojo Rawley. The good guys won, uh, as, as you always showed on the pre-show. On the main card, Natalia and Carmella defeated Becky Lynch and Naomi. Shinsuke Nakamura went over Rusev, as expected. Uh, unexpectedly, Randy Orton took the U.S. title from Bobby Roode in really a nothing match. I, yeah. I, I can't take anything away from it, technically speaking, but Randy Orton is just boring as all sin. It, and Bobby it had Roode. no hype. I, yeah. I kept, sorry, I don't want to cut you off. Go ahead. 
Now it's just face Bobby Roode has been really lackluster. Yeah. And it, it's not just him being a face. It's him being a WWE face. Because uh, I, I loved Bobby Roode as a face in, in TNA. But I thought he had all the fire in the world when, when Fortune was going up against Immortal. And uh, in his subsequent face run after his record-breaking uh, title run, I, I thought he was a pretty good face there, too. Like, and him being part of Beer Money. People love the dude. Yeah. But him being a face now, especially after his spectacular heel run down in NXT, or at least, at least as far as his character work went at any rate, like, it, it's just felt so bland. I, yeah, I think that's a great word for it. Bland and, you know, I mean, for all intents and purpose, listen, the Glorious Song is great and everybody loves to sing it. But part of the reason that it works is because... It's a schmarmy dude telling you he's glorious, not because you actually appreciate it. Even if you do appreciate him as being glorious, he's still telling you that it's true. He's not showing you. He, I mean, don't get me wrong. He's great in the ring, but he's not necessarily showing you. He's telling you that he's glorious. And he's walking out in a Ric Flair robe and, you know, basically doing all like heal things you know i mean maybe maybe not in action but like we've been preconditioned through nxt to see all that even if we enjoy it and can respect that it's good heel work it's still heel work at the end of the day and they really haven't done anything aesthetically to change that you know yeah he's saying different things and he's a go-getter and he wants to be the best u.s champion that ever lived but that's the bland part and then whatever we're left with it still feels kind of healy, you know, mm-hmm. R- respect to beanbag saying that, you know, that type of sort of in WA main event style match, if that is what it is, because I really didn't watch a lot of uh, in WA heyday. Um, if you like this match, I'm not trying to hate on you, but I couldn't help but watch this match and just listen to commentary constantly hype it as like one of the best U.S. title matches we've ever seen. And I the just kind of was. Yeah, I just kind of sat there scratching my head with an eyebrow raise. Like, are, are we watching the same match? Because, I mean, I'm not going to say it's terrible. I've seen worse. Fucking look at Jeff Hardy versus Sting. Sorry, I guess that's <laughs> more topical than I realized before I said that. Um, <laughs> but. Yeah, I've seen worse matches, but I don't know. It just it really didn't do anything for me. I, I didn't yeah. feel any excitement. I didn't feel any reason to be rooting for anybody or hating anybody or anything. It was just kind of there. Yeah, I mean, there was a reason why up until this year, nobody was talking about the NWA. And it's because all of the flavor went away. You can be a fantastic technical wrestler, but if you have all the personality of wet cardboard, you're not going to draw anybody. Like The audience has moved on from that. Wrestling at its heyday was never just about the wrestling. It was about the characters. And Bobby Roode is a fantastic character. Even in the, in, even in the WWE, he has shown evidence of that. But... You throw him up against Randy Orton, who has never been an exciting person to watch anyway, and and you have Bobby Roode work with all the personality leached out of him. Like, where's the appeal? Where is where's the draw? There there really isn't any. It was just a a nothing face versus somehow face match, and I I don't understand why he's still a face. He, he looked pissed to close out that match. So I, I I don't understand why he hasn't gone full on bad guy rude yet. Maybe it'd be different if gender wasn't involved. I don't know. But that's what I thought. I thought we were going to be getting NXT Bobby Roode again, which it would at least add some flavor. Because I would love to see Bobby Roode play the, the, the big talking cowardly heel again. Yeah. Yep. That's Randy Orton's bread and butter when he's a face, it just to to go after those dudes. You know, and it's a shame, too, because uh, I watched Talking Smack after uh, 
after Fastlane. And, you know, listening to Orton talk there, like, I mean, at worst, it was tolerable. You know, he felt like a real person when he talked there. He even fucking gave props to gender, saying, listen, I consider myself a pretty badass uh, WWE superstar, but I lost to him three times in a row. You know, that, that's cool and refreshing. I know that kind of speaks a little bit more towards how good Talking Smack is and how good Randy is. But I kind of feel, in a way, it's a little similar to uh, Roman, only I don't think it's the WWE not letting Randy be Randy. I think it's Randy not letting Randy be Randy. For whatever reason, if he's just not engaged, which we've debated several times on this show, if he just doesn't want to change or, or whatever, like he's just not allowing himself that creative outlet that I think he potentially still has. Because I mean, I like the legend killer gimmick when like young up start, you know, early aughts, Randy Orton, I thought was really good, <laughs> at least decent. <laughs> so it's not like, it's not like, you know, he, he doesn't have the potential, but it's just, it's been so long with no new developments and so many times with seem things seemingly being phoned in, uh, that I just, I, it's, it's, it's also kind of a little bit Ziggler esque. Like, I don't expect any change from him anymore. Mm. Yeah, I mean, at this point, why would he? Like, he, he's still treated as one of the top faces of the product. People still cheer for him. So, yeah, I mean, why would he do anything but mail it in? I, I, I get it. I can't fault the dude for sticking to what works. It's just, it's boring as sin. Yeah, agreed. Uh, elsewhere on Fastlane, Charlotte did retain the SmackDown Women's Championship against Ruby Riot. Carmelo did not, in fact, cash in. Um, and then we had Asuka show up and uh, point at the sign. Yep. You know, she made her choice. She she picked the better champion. Uh, she said as much herself. And it's going to be Charlotte versus Asuka at Mania, uh, which is just... It's arguably going to be the better match, but... The way it was brought about is just some of the Russo est bullshit I've ever seen. Um, but it, it, it is what it is. Uh, it, Charlotte and Ruby put on a pretty good match. Um, yep. I, I honestly think Ruby's ready to be champion already. Uh, may, maybe that's why I ignored the obvious and picked Ruby to win. But, you know, again, it is what it is. Charlotte wins so that. You set up a uh, triumphant champion against an undefeated challenger. Sure, that's that's what I think it is more. I I, I think the better technically wrestled match, which might have been a great transition too, considering just leaving the Bobby Roode and Randy Orton match. I think the better technically wrestled match would have been between Alexa and Asuka. I think their styles would have meshed better. Um, that's not to say that obviously Charlotte is a great hand in the ring. Um, but I think this match has more marquee value to it. I think it's just like you said, it's the for arguably untested champion versus the, you know, undefeated challenger. Um, and that that's not a terrible story considering we're going into WrestleMania and that's kind of wrestling booking 101. Um, but a little bit, a little part of me is sad that we're not seeing Alexa versus Asuka, though we are getting Naya challenging for the title. And if Nia wins, I'll be pretty happy about that. So I guess all things said and done, I'm not too terribly upset about the way the women's titles are being handled going into WrestleMania. Yeah. I, apart from my invocation of Russo with, with his booking, like, I, I'm not mad about sure. it either because like, Charlotte versus Asuka is going to be interesting to watch. Um, I and think I may have been more interested in Alexa versus Asuka as well, just because that's where the story was going. But again, the story was kind of, like Nye isn't exactly coming out of left field. Uh, this has been teased for months now. Uh, this on again, off again friendship that is sometimes rocked by Naya kind of eyeing that title a little bit uh, here and there. But yeah, I, I think we're going to be getting some pretty good women's matches or at least title matches at Mania. Yep. Um, I, I could maybe wish for more of a program with Charlotte and Asuka because there wasn't really much to be said on SmackDown. Like they had a face to face 
and Charlotte talked up a lot about the match itself, and Oscar told her that you aren't ready for Asuka. Uh, I I could wish for more time for that story to have unfolded, but then again, what story do you would really help the uh, just a name value attached to this match? Uh, the Queen versus the Empress, uh, Charlotte Flair versus the the undefeated one. So yeah, um, I, I think we've talked at length enough about the SmackDown tag team title match. Sure. Um, which really only leaves the WWE title match where in AJ defended successfully against Cena, Zayn, Owens, Ziggler, and Corbin. And, uh, All right I, I, the world. <laughs> yeah, really. I mean, I, I don't think you can really say anything more than that about the match uh, other than the man who should have won one. Yeah. It was fun. I had fun. Well, while watching it. Yeah. It, it, I don't think it was anything spectacular, but I don't think it was a bad match either. Um, I, I think maybe if the outcome wasn't so clear, like if you didn't already have Styles versus Nakamura on the horizon, and think you can't fuck that up. There's just too much money at stake. You can't fuck that up. Yeah, I, I think if that hadn't been a factor, maybe I would have paid more attention and been more invested in the various ups and downs of, of the individual wrestlers. Um, it, like everybody teaming up on Cena at one point early on, like that was an interesting spot. Um, I think it would have been more interesting had everybody not just lined up and taken the AA one after another until yeah. AJ and Cena was left. Yeah, that was kind of a dumb spot. Like, there, there is a uh, a thing about combat in the Assassin's Creed video games being to all right, you step up and get yeah. and stabbed, <laughs> and all of the all of the other enemies on the perimeter just stand back and watch it happen until it's their turn. Like. Yeah. I felt that vibe there with, with that spot, but you know, there were only a few spots where I just sat there and thought, man, they didn't really think this through at all. Did they? <laughs> sure. Um, Baron throwing Ziggler through the glass of the uh, Columbus Blue Jackets arena that was yeah. still up. Like, that was why, why is that still set up? Like, I, I have legitimately so no idea. Throw, so Baron could throw Ziggler through it, obviously. Yeah, I, mean, I guess. <laughs> Um, I just want to see the narrative like that's a backstage segment that got lost of like you see this guy starting to dismantle it and Baron walks up to him and he's like no and then just walks away <laughs> leave it I want it there <laughs> for reasons <laughs> um, Shane getting involved was was bullshit um, that super I, kick I, he took was pretty Good looking though, I thought. Sure, I I will never say no to Shane getting kicked in the face. <laughs> um, the spot where where Sammy laid down for Kevin, like he said, and the ensuing the ensuing sequence where Kevin started to haul him up, and then Sammy rolled him up. Yeah, and like, there there is that's some nuance, there, man. I like it. Yeah, like there are various interpretations of that. Like, was Kevin hauling him up to beat his ass because he didn't trust him? Was Kevin pulling him up to hug him because, like, that was just the kind of guy Sammy is? Was Sammy rolling him up because that was his plan all along? Or was Sammy just panicking and reacting to the, the idea of Kevin beating the shit out of him? Sure. Like, you can't really say definitively one way or the other. Like, yeah. I like that that gray area, that vagueness. Um, And then Sammy walking up to Shane on the outside. Is this what you wanted? Huh? Is this what you wanted all along? And then super kick. Right. Like, I, I, I like that, that bit. I like that. Really, Sammy and Kevin were the best part of that match for me. Like, yeah. aside from AJ finally sealing the deal and, and, and winning, as he should have, I can't think of anything better than that. No, I, I definitely agree. It's, it's, it was a, you know, for all the, the dismantleization we might have, uh, invoked upon the Owen, Zane, and Shane storyline, uh, earlier in the show, I, I felt like that was a, a bright spot in an otherwise kind of dark feud. Um, and, and I thought it did play well. And, and especially, uh, continuing the narrative, one of the interesting things that I found with, uh, this storyline going forward, even after this match is that narrative of the dissension between 
Kevin and Sammy because it's not as cut and dry as, um, well, I mean, arguably any of, uh, Sammy and Kevin's, uh, dissension previous or anyone else that Kevin has been teamed with previous that, uh, has eventually caused some sort of dissension. So I, I kind of like that. I like that at least between the two of them, that they're playing hard and fast with, with, who and I know that's kind of makes me sound a little bit like a hypocrite, but that's okay. Um, at least between the two of them, you, you're not clear as to who is trying to uh, outdo who, so to speak. If either of them are, you know, that part of the narrative, I think they've done very well. Um, I just wish that there wasn't like also a ring of extra confusion with Shane getting involved and who between the three of them is supposed to be. The, the outright hero, or if there is one, that part starts to, I think, lose the uh, the luster of the storyline for me. Yeah, absolutely. I, it's just so true with so many guys, but if you just let Kevin and Sammy do their thing, they could easily be the top act in the WWE. Like they they weren't the first guys on the indies to really figure it out and make a name for themselves outside of the WWE, but. I mean, they were some of the best at it. So yeah. I, maybe something could be learned from that. I don't know. Sure. Uh, elsewhere in the WWE, uh, we have one of the two that are going to be fighting for the Cruiserweight title of Mania solidified. Cedric Alexander beat Roderick Strong this week on 205 Live, or this past week on 205 Live, at least. Um Moving on to the final match, that leaves Mustafa Ali versus Drew Gulak um, next week, I would assume. And that makes me a little sad because I, I wished there was a way that it would be Ali versus Gulak at Mania. Like, nothing against Cedric, but Ali and Gulak have definitely proven to be the two most high profile guys out of this tournament, like especially with Ali's new promos the the ones that he's been cutting like those are fantastic and gulak just the reaction to what happened with the dismantling of the zo train the uh the way that drake maverick has been running 205 live and just him reverting to that that badass gladiator stick that he had coming into the cruiserweight classic that's been such a great transformation to see and i would love to see that play that culmination play out at mania but i i'm i'm betting on ali going on to face cedric but either way i wouldn't be mad yeah uh i i think uh the the potential for the cruiserweight title match at wrestlemania is is really really well done you know i i'm happy to see you know just the fact that cedric ali and uh gulak are all even mentioned as legit cruiserweight contenders not all this fake well they're in the division so everybody's a contender bullshit like they're actually being treated as as real you know good viable options for uh for the next cruiserweight champion i i I like the hell out of that it's only a shame that only one of them gets to be uh this mania although i have a feeling that they all will put that belt around their waist uh as their careers unfold yeah, undoubtedly. Um, if I had to pick anybody, it would have to be Ali. Um, and, and Gulak would be a close second behind him because those two guys are great promos, are great workers. Cedric's a great worker, but he's not a great promo. Like, I, I just don't feel the emotion or passion from him on the mic that I do from Ali and Gulak. And I, I certainly won't be mad if, if a, if a, if a dude from Charlotte, North Carolina wins the belt, but I, I do think it would be doing a bit of a disservice to either Ali or Gulak if that happens. Uh, just to be honest. Sure. Uh, shifting over to NXT. Um, I actually watched NXT from last week. Uh, the Dusty Rhodes cl- Tag Team Classic kicked off. Um, I, I will say before I get into that too much, um, Bianca Belair beat a jobber. You know, extending her uh, her winning streak since the since the Mayon Classic, just kind of a nothing match. Uh, Alistair Black defeated Killian Dane for number one contendership. 
my watching has been spotty, so I don't know if there was any actual process leading up to that or if that was just they didn't like each other. Guys. <laughs> they 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 were okay. kind of jaw jacking with each other for the last couple of weeks, but nothing like I, I think it's only been a couple of weeks that they've even really been on each other's radar. So nothing like extremely deep and extensive. Yeah, I, I figured as much. NX, NXT's kind of been that way for a little yeah. while now. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this is just my dissatisfaction with Alistair steamrolling everything in his path and the fact that he's still undefeated. I don't know if it's that talking, but I really wish Killian and Dana beaten him. Is that weird? No, no, it's it's not weird. I, I definitely think uh, Dane is a underutilized talent. Um, and, and I say that with a slight grain of salt thrown in because um, I, I do think he's doing well for Sanity and makes them look more credible by being with them. Um, that said, it does feel like he's getting just the basic big guy treatment in NXT. Uh, which is unfortunate because I've seen I've seen his work elsewhere and he can be so much more than that. I mean, don't get me wrong. His wheelhouse is still a lot of big guy stuff, a lot of slams and, you know, big splashes on the mat and stuff like that. And I'm not necessarily saying that he's reinventing the big guy wheel there, but he's got so much character and charisma to him that it's it's kind of a bummer that he uh he only uh, ever gets to kind of be the the uh, stage background for the rest of Sanity. Um, mm-hmm. I do like, though, that he's starting to get more singles notoriety, as in the case here. And, you know, even in his uh, tag team title run with uh, – uh, well, actually, no, I'm sorry. He wasn't the champion at that time. But even when he and uh, Alexander Wolf were – kind of bat, you know battling the narrative against uh, uh the undisputed era you got to see a little bit more characterization for him and i think that's a good thing um alistair black in fairness even though i really enjoy his character it's one note you know there, there's there hasn't been a lot of reinvention of it since he's been debuted in fairness he hasn't necessarily i don't think worn it out uh totally just yet but there's not a lot of room to develop anything. I felt like the most development we got from him was in his feud with uh, Velveteen Dream. And that has sort of existed as a satellite uh, compared to the rest of his run. Uh, he hasn't really had that same kind of um, cult of personality interaction with anyone else. So uh, it, it would be nice to see a little bit more uh, of a rounded attitude from Aleister Black. Uh, that said, I, I don't see it being too long before he gets uh, injected into the into the main roster stuff. I don't know if that's a good thing. I think he could use some more NXT seasoning just again to develop that character. But I think the WWE really wants to push him very hard, case in point, as he's already been pushed. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see him appearing on the main roster within the next six months or so. Yeah, maybe. Um, I, I, I remember seeing real actual emotion on his face against Adam Cole. Uh, like, uh, the, the tag team match that pitted him and Roderick strong against the undisputed. I remember him being so worked up and furious when, at, when Cole lured him up into the stands, allowing, Fish and O'Reilly to take apart Roddy. Like, I remember seeing a look on his face and, and thinking the unflappable has finally flapped. Like I thought we were going to see an evolution of the character from there. And then he just kept being the same robot, essentially. Like the dude can work like a fucking madman. But like, getting him to emote feels like it's it's a process of pulling teeth. Like teeth that are in there real real good and it's hard to get excited about that at this point i i think of him facing almas and i think it's going to be a good match but then i think about him beating almas and i am just all kinds of salty about that prospect because one it's too soon i think almas needs to hold that belt for a good long time i think he's finally gotten to a point where He's getting good reactions from the crowd. 
consistently. And then to have that all thrown away so that Alistair can continue to remain undefeated in singles competition, that feels like a huge waste to me because I don't see Alistair Black as champion being a good thing for NXT. I, I see him being another, I see him being another Shinsuke Nakamura or Bobby Roode or Samoa Joe or Finn Balor where nothing really happens. It's just the same feud over and over again. I definitely also want to clarify too, that, just because I think he may be going to the main roster uh, soon doesn't necessarily mean I think he'll be NXT champion soon. Um, it's not hard to see that. I'm not going to say it's completely out of the realm of possibility, but I don't know if he needs to have the accolade of NXT champion uh, under his belt at all, really. Um, I, I think they see him very similar to a, a Balor, um, as you mentioned, where – I think they just kind of want him to get familiar with the WWE system of working, and then they want to, you know, basically sell as much merchandise as they can with him uh, up on the main roster. Um, and I, I don't think you necessarily need to hurt the uh, the NXT title to do that, uh, because I agree. I, I think if if they had more storylines similar to his feud with Dream. Uh, while champion, I think I think that would be very very interesting to see. But Dream's only one dude, and I don't see many other people exuding the charisma that he exudes. Um, not going to say that anyone else wouldn't have a time making a uh, entertaining uh, program against Alistair with the title involved, but I think it'd be much harder. You know, I, th I think it's it's very. That stoic, stone-faced, you know, darker than dark type of character, it's not unwanted or unseen in in wrestling, but it's very hard to work against. I mean, even mm -hmm. taking someone like The Undertaker, you know, there, there's a lot of, of nuance that has had to be paid over the years to make his character work, you know, because he can't cut promos every week. Um, it, it would kind of destroy the character, I think, the more you got to peek under the veil. You know, in fact, when they gave him the opportunity to talk as much as they wanted, they had to completely change the gimmick, you know, because it wouldn't have worked in the Phenom form. And I think that's the kind of issue that Black is having, how to find that balance of being able to get across your emotions without necessarily betraying the character you want to portray. That part may take a little bit longer to work out. Um, which is why I would like to see him stay a little bit longer in NXT. Um, but I don't know. I, I could definitely see a hot shot. You know, I personally am, am very curious to see a, a match between him and Finn Balor. Um, and I feel like the WWE is kind of on that same pulse. Yeah, I, I think what what Alistair Black, as he currently stands right now, I think what that boils down to is he is a niche attraction, not the main event. Yeah. And like, there's nothing wrong with, with the stone cold badass um, wrestler that you just throw guys at and watch, watch them get thrown into the meat grinder. Like there's a place for that, but not when it becomes a focal point of the show. Like that is, it, it, it can't be allowed to be that forever. Like something needs to happen. Alistair needs to get broken at some point. Um, whether that is Velveteen Dream making him say his name or whether that is Adam Cole getting him to crack, uh, the mask of impassivity, like something needs to stick here. Yeah. And it just feels like nothing is stuck yet. Yeah, I agree. Uh, maybe almost beating him could be that thing that sticks. Sure. Like somebody that is the antithesis of what Alistair stands for, uh, a charismatic playboy figure. Like they they've toned back the party boy aspect of his character a lot ever since Zelina paired up with him, but he is still El Ingobernable. He is El Idolo. He is that that cocky heel and. The charisma is evident. Yeah. So, like, if he beats Alistair, maybe that makes Alistair question who he is to his very core. Maybe you see something more dangerous, more unhinged emerge. 
something that is not just a lack of emotion, but is a wellspring of emotion. Maybe, I don't know. But I, I would love just something, anything to change and stick with him. Yeah, um I agree. The question is being raised in the live chat. Will this be Andrade Cien Amas' last NXT match? It better not be. <laughs> like, I don't think he's ready for the main roster. Like, I don't, Let me rephrase that. Almas is more than ready to work the main roster. I don't think the audience is ready yet. Just because of how long it took for them to react to him? Because I don't think he's changed overly much since he first hit the scene in NXT. I think it's the audience's perception of him that's changed. Uh, I don't know. Just because a lot of his indie work wasn't in Ring of Honor or PWG. It was in CMLL in New Japan. Uh, before New Japan really became the the hit that is is now in the States. So I, I think it took a while for that charisma, that ability, that that talent to really soak in, I, I, at least from where I'm seeing it. I think he needs more time on maybe a smaller stage to really pave the way for a main roster appearance, uh, kind of like Nakamura did, kind of like Finn Balor did. Because um, if they had just debuted on the main roster, maybe they wouldn't have been as big a deal. Um, but like when Nakamura first came on the main roster, everybody was singing along with the theme song because that had become a thing. When Finn Balor first hit the main roster, everybody w was doing the arm taunt that he does with, with his entrance because they'd seen it in NXT. Maybe almost needs something like that before he makes the move up. I would agree with that. I think, uh, I don't know if it's necessarily the audience. Well, here's what I'll say. Cause I feel like I was one of those. Uh, audience members that was kind of skeptical of him when, uh, when he first debuted in, uh, in NXT. Um, and, and subsequently they just didn't feel like there was a lot for me to be interested in. You know, technically speaking, we've said that all throughout the show, um, for, for many, uh, different people. I felt it the same about him. I felt he could work a match. You know, I feel like anybody who makes it to the WWE's level is confident enough to, to, carry a match, you know, it, depending on a lot of factors, but at the very least you can carry a match. But I just didn't feel like his character had much for me to get interested in um, until Selena Vega came along and started to kind of clean up his act a little bit and, and you know, helped him out with, with some really good, I think, solid cocky promos, you know, and, and whatnot. Um, that said, I would also like to see him uh, continue in NXT as champion. Um, not just to, to get him a little bit more familiarized with a mainstream audience, but also I, I think, I think there's something to be said of what, what type of room there is for you. Because let's be honest, whenever any NXT call up conversation comes up, it's always where are they going and what's, what's best suited for them. And within at least the last year, looking at other NXT call-ups, what I'm always worried about is, is there room for them right now up on Raw or SmackDown? And what I mean by that is, is creative going to pay them enough attention and give them enough mind to, you know, give them uh, material to work off of? Because I don't want to see Andrade become the next Mojo Rawley or... Uh, you know, the next Tyler Breeze. Yeah, Tyler Breeze or anything like that. I don't want to see him uh, flounder because they don't got anything for him or they feel like they don't. Um, so I think that kind of also speaks a little bit to the crowd's familiarity and whatnot because seeing the, everybody in a 20,000 plus arena doing the hand thing with Finn Balor or singing uh, Nakamura's song goes a long way to showing. Uh, creative and upper management up at the main roster, this guy is someone that the fans want to see. And I don't know if – I think he got a decent reaction at, at the Rumble, but I don't think it was decent enough to to say that he's main roster ready yet. I think he needs a little bit more time to, to build that up. Honestly, I wouldn't mind them trading on the, the Los Ingobernables tie a little bit. Um. 
Because that is an incredibly hot act right now, at least the the De Japon uh, branch of the faction. I you see almost raises a fist uh, when he comes out, and you see some folks raising along with him. But I would like for that to be you know more universal because if you've got something that encourages fan participation, like that is going to be a plus for you when it comes to main event roster time. That's not necessarily going to be an indicator of where you sit. Look at Bobby Roode. But I, I'm beginning to wonder if that's just a product of NXT call-ups of SmackDown just being a recipe for failure at this point. Because I can't think of anybody on, on SmackDown right now that came out of NXT and is really going anywhere except for Nakamura. So I don't know. It, it's just such a crapshoot anymore with people. Because guys that you think are surefire recipes for success – just don't pan out that way. Like, who would have looked at what Tyler Breeze was doing in NXT and think that, it was yeah, they're just going to piss him away it. and have him yeah. just be a feature on Up, Up, Down, Down, and oh, the Breeze on goes a thing now for whatever reason. And Ty Dillinger, that dude was pretty over by the time he left NXT. And then, I don't know, he's a number 10 guy at the Rumble <laughs> once. And then he kind of was again, but then not yeah, anymore. That's, that's fair enough. <laughs> that's fair correction. Yeah, I, I, I just hope for the best with Amos because he was a top guy in CMLL for good reason. And he could very well be a top guy in WWE. It's just do they know what they have with him? I think give it a couple more months, especially with Selena Vega as the mouthpiece, because I think that's another thing that main roster is very afraid of is someone who can't uh, speak English like perfectly like it, like someone who's spoken English their entire life. Um, mm-hmm. Which is a shame because, I mean, there's some really great talent there that just happens to not speak English for whatever, you know, life choice reason that they don't. Or at least not speak it well enough to, let's say, cut a great promo, you know. Yeah, to um, not get a what chant right, every right. opportunity the audience gets. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, I think uh, I'm, I'm glad to see that they're getting giving uh, Nakamura and Asuka a lot more time. Uh, to speak and whatnot and, and show that even with very few words that they can fucking, you know, keep a crowd in the palm of their hands. I, I, I think Selena Vega helps that a lot with, uh, with Almas. Yeah. Selena is a lot better on the mic than I remember her being because when she was, uh, Rosita in TNA, I, I don't remember her being this good. I, clearly she's come a long way and being married to Austin Aries certainly can't help in that department because God knows Austin can talk. Sure. But yeah, um, I, th- one last little bit that I'll speak on from NXT um, is I, I mentioned before the Dusty Rhodes Classic has gotten started again. And it started with a, uh, a rematch from the finals of the last one with AOP versus TM61. And correct me if I'm wrong, but this was TM61's on screen return. That is correct. Um, yeah, Shane. Uh, What's his last name? Shane Thorne. Yeah, Shane Thorne uh, was injured for the longest time, and TM61 has worked some house shows uh, since he was cleared to return. But this match was their return match. And for whatever reason, the Authors of Pain won and have advanced to the second round. And I don't understand why. Everything made, made all the sense in the world for TM61 to advance. Because they just came back, it would be a perfect story to tell for TM61 to do what they couldn't before and beat AOP, knock them out of the first round. AOP didn't need the win because they're already two-time NXT tag champs. Why do they need the win over this hot babyface team? But AOP won anyway. Like Maybe because they're facing heavy machinery in the next round? I don't know. Because I assume that's what's going to happen. Like I don't imagine the Street Profits going over. I it's just a better match, like AOP versus Heavy Machinery, Haas team versus Haas team. Yeah. And I would love for Heavy Machinery to go over in that scenario, except I can't confidently claim that anymore because AOP beat TM61. Like, I don't get it. Yeah. And especially because for months now, I've been saying that AOP is main event ready or main roster ready, I should say. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, like we were saying before, talking about Braun and the bar and the rest of the Raw Tag Team division. What a perfect debut would that have been if they had taken that promo 
um, that, that, uh, Seamus and, and Cesaro, uh, cut on Kurt in the backstage and instead put that, just the two of them in the, uh, in the, in fact, actually, no, and don't even go that far. Take the promo of them saying they've beaten every tag team on the raw roster. And instead of having the raw roster run out and beat the shit out of them, what if fucking Ellering said, you haven't beaten everyone. And then AOP walks out. That would have fucking gone over huge. That would have ruled. I would have marked like a bitch, man. And, and I don't, I don't see how, what they've decided to do really helps anyone. I don't think it helps the authors. It definitely doesn't help TM61. Uh, the bar now has to fight a, singles competitor at best who might find another partner and realistically shouldn't be challenging for the tag titles in any form or facet at this year's WrestleMania. Um, yeah, it, it just seems like a miss all around. Yeah. How you look at the raw tag team title match of mania and think, Oh no, instead of this, this hot dominant Haas team from NXT, let's throw the bar up against Braun Strowman and an arm bar competitor. Because that's really what it's going to be yeah. if they don't just decide to have Braun destroy the bar by himself. Right. <laughs> this company sometimes, man. I did. Yeah. I don't get it. I'm, I'm with you, dude. Uh, but uh, I mentioned it before uh, tonight. Actually, it's already happened on on screen by now. Uh, Street Profits versus Heavy Machinery will have happened. Also, uh, Lacey Evans versus Dakota Kai. Um, that sounds like it should be a fun match. Pete Dunn versus Adam Cole. I imagine that would have been the main event. Um, I don't think the title was supposed to be on the line, but, uh, also probably a really good match might lead to a title match at TakeOver New Orleans. I don't know. Um, but speaking of titles, uh, the, I think it was supposed to be a contract signing between, uh, Almas and Alistair. Uh, cause I remember Morrow saying that it was going to be made official tonight. I just don't remember the words contract signing being used. Uh, but I think that's going to be the entirety of tonight's NXT episode. Um, so it sounds like it should be a fun episode to go back and watch at the very least. Yeah. Um, but I think that's going to do it for tonight's show. Uh, weirdly enough, I, I think we were both expecting this as, to be a, a shorter show and, here we are, well over two and a half hours in. Uh, yeah. It's like I said at the top, it's mania season, bro. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. I, I don't think we're going to be getting a show in under two hours until after mania at this point. If, if then. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> given our track record. And on that bombshell, uh, this is where we are going to say goodbye. Now, you can find us at fanstalkpodcast.com. That is our homepage for everything we do. Uh, that's where you can find the archive. That's where you can find links to our Facebook group, as well as our Discord live chat, where we uh, have live chats for this very show, as well as upcoming shows. Uh, Lucha Underground is going to be coming back in the not-too-distant future, so that will probably mean a return of Fans Talk Lucha. Uh, any other shows that we feel like doing at any given time, that's where you'll find it as well. You can also follow us on Twitter at Fans Talk Podcast. That's where you can shoot us topics that you'd like us to discuss. Uh, just for funsies, use the hashtag AskFTPW. If you listen to the show through a podcatcher like Apple Podcasts or Stitcher, uh, leave us a rating and review, whatever is applicable at any given time. We'd love to hear your feedback, what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong. Um, do you like these marathon shows where we go for two and a half hours? Would you prefer a shorter show? We could try it. <laughs> see if we like it uh, we we might fail in that endeavor but we would at least try of course uh, and that goes for listening in on SoundCloud or uh, an app like TuneIn Radio uh, any kind of feedback you can give us we more than welcome it next week we're on the road to WrestleMania proper uh, there's going to be big things happening there's going to be small things happening there's going to be good things happening hopefully there's Probably going to be bad things happening, too. Uh, so we're going to be talking the good, the bad, and the ugly all in its entirety. But until then, for Adam, Garvin, everybody in the live chat, my name is Nick, and we'll see you next time here on Fans Talk Pro Wrestling. Good night, y'all. <laughs>